I think White is winning here. As I think so too, but both players are down to 15 seconds, so it's not just about the position, but also how fast they can play. And the Sergisian should be winning this, but after D3, okay, D3, King, C3 still. Yep. And then you go D2, and I'll go King, C2. And your Knight, again, has to stay protecting the pawn, and then I'll bring my Rook to do the rest. So here comes D2, King, C2 here. Well, rook d6, and now king e3. Yeah. Uh-oh. So what's going on? Well, yeah, the problem is king c2, knight d4 check, closing the d5. Well, then I maybe can sit on d1. King d1. Okay, so I... Oh, but no, b5's hanging. Oh, no. Ooh. King d1, knight takes b5. And rook takes d2, knight takes a3. So I think black is getting just enough pawns here, because rook a2 is meant by knight c4, and you can't take on a4 because knight b2 check. So th this looks like it's been mishandled by both sides, and lately by honestly, just in B5, so I King C3, and then if I'm black, I go King F4, King G4, go over and take that last white pawn and say, I'm, there's no way I can lose this position. So I think finally, when this position is done here, it's just going to be a draw. Don't take on B5 yet, otherwise next And we are here, Grandmaster Robert Hess here with, well, one of my favorite people on the planet, International Master Anna Rudolph. Anna, how are you doing today? Thank you so much, Robert, for such a kind introduction. I thought that you're one of your favorite people in the world would be the pug behind me, but I'm glad it's me, actually. Well, I do love pug dogs. I don't know if you knew that, but I am a huge pug fan. I think they're cute. I had no idea. They are my favorite dogs and Frenchies. They're your f I did not know that either. So we actually have a lot more in common than we thought even just like 15 minutes ago. But um, True. I'm, I'm going to host. I see that I'm hosting Hikaru, which I love his streams. And I'm going to host the Pro Chess League stream on my channel too. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I'm a huge pug fan. I think they get a bad rap. Some people think they're really ugly, but I find them to be adorable. I really do. So. I think so too. The uglier, the cuter. I mean... You know what? We're just not shallow. We watched A Star Is Born. We heard Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper sing the song "Shallow," and we decided. Ah, uh, that not was to just be. brilliant, by the way. <laughs> Heart melting, and also the performance. Oh, absolutely amazing! But for everyone tuning in just now, where this is the Pro Chess League, it is the Eastern Division, and we see the matchup between the Mumbai Movers and the Moscow Phoenix to start with, and the games have just begun. So before we dive really deeply into the chess. I'm going to bring up just a little, some of the things we have here going on. I have all of the boards 
um, a, you know, a scene with that. So I can say who's on board one, board two, board three, and board four for each team. Uh, some teams going with that even lineup across the board where they have tw 2,500s on board one and then still have 2,450s on board four. So that is a team like the Mumbai Mo Movers uses that format. And Anna, in general, do you tend to like the evenly rated teams across the board or do you prefer to have a superstar GM on the top and then maybe a lower rated board four? I think it's always a, a very interesting question. And with the regular matches, I don't know if I have the right answer for that. With the Battle Royale, I saw that teams that have very similar rating on most boards, uh, like the Dallas Destiny, for instance, I saw that in the Battle Royale format, they don't have an advantage via, when they are playing the regular matches. Uh, if you have like a 24 or even 2,500 almost on board four, that means that you have a really strong team and maybe that's a good lineup, but there's no, there's no recipe for the protest league. If there was, I think everybody would be doing the same. So we see teams that have like really high board one and board twos and other teams are more balanced. Uh, what's your take on this, Robert? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I said this on one of my recent streams that, uh, for teams in the battle Royale, it's, I think 2400s are better at beating 2000s than mm -hmm. 2800s are beating 2500s. Like the 300 True. points that go on the board four are, are much more important. I think you see people win much more frequently there. So it's a very interesting discussion and one that we'll continue to have as we gear up towards the playoffs because we will see some evenly matched teams you know, across the board versus some superstars like Fabiano Caruana and Wesley So. But um, Anna, this is also going to be fun. I pulled up some quotes from some players, and we're about to. We have the game between uh, Mohammed Nuber Shaik or Sheikh. I'm not entirely for sure how he pronounces his name, but I do have this fun quote from him, saying, "His proudest non-chess accomplishment is he designed and prepared a model of an underwater hotel." What? <laughs> yeah, right. So these chess players do so much more than just play chess, and that is really cool. So he actually became one of my new favorite players in the league because this is what he does in his, well, I don't know if it's his free time or his day job, but either way, really cool stuff. That's just really impressive. Now I'm a fan of the Mumbai Movers player, Nubar Shah. That's, that's something that I would love to see in real life. So I'm hoping that his model is actually being built and I'm going to visit that hotel for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, as soon as that is proven safe, I'll definitely visit as well. And well, speaking of proven safe, his position here with the YPs, I'm a little surprised how much time he spent because it's mm -hmm. move, just move six was played by Mi Mikhail Demidov. And I mean, Anna, this is a very normal position for white. And you can choose either to play G3 followed by Bishop G2 or an immediate E3 or E4 and have this bishop develop uh, to the E2 or D3 square. So I'm not sure why he spent five minutes for the first six moves thus far. This is a moment when I would like to ask uh, Greg Shahad if he's here with us in the chat. Uh, he's the one and the chess.com team who can see the players. Is he even sitting at the board? I was like, maybe the mailman has arrived or his lunch is running out of the pot, like he's cooking something. <laughs> who knows what's going on at his place? Yeah, no, it's uh, he's there now. But actually, I have to go to this game between Dmitry uh, Kriavkin and Raunik Sadwani. That is Savelli mm -hmm. Tartikauer versus Champ 2005 because it's your favorite opening and my favorite opening to make fun of. The French. Eh. <laughs> so we have a French on the board here. And Anna, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm liking it for black because black is up a pawn here. The king seems quite safe, tucked away on this d7 square. And well, that white rook is stuck to the a1 square, protecting a3. I think black has got the upper hand in this position. Finally, Robert is admitting the truth. The truth we have all known forever, except for Robert, that the French defense is a great opening. <sighs> No, no, it's not what I said. I'm not admitting anything of the sort, but here I just happen to like Black's position in this one position and this one position only. Well, I'm glad that you like it. Ronak Sadvani, by the way, for those of you who don't know his name, he is an Indian prodigy that you gotta remember, only 13 years old and he almost beat Vichy Anand in the Isle of Man tournament, a classical tournament. So definitely we're gonna see a lot more of this Indian boy with the white pieces. Yeah, for sure. And well, for his team right now, he has the white pieces and he's playing a nearly 2600 rated GM. 
And, okay, he's obviously more than capable of holding his own against such a strong player, but here he needs to prove it. Because when I see a position like this, and you can speak to this much better than I can, Anna, the queenside pawns for white in any endgame are problematic, especially with a pesky knight. Because you want to play a6, knight a7, knight b5. It's a very common mm -hmm. thematic way to attack those pawns. And if I'm black in this position, instead of rook uh, h8, which... Okay, actually, I didn't like rook h8 because I thought the rook was fine for the moment on h7. I really would have considered trying to go queen b5 and then queen to b2 and just sitting this queen down in enemy territory, waiting until that rook tries to move away from a1, and then the a3 and c3 pawns, one of which will probably be hanging at some point. I completely agree with you, and the h6 pawn is not really a danger that it's going to be captured because that would open up the h5, and you see that the h5 bishop, the h4 knight are all in the air, so I don't think it's a good idea for white to even try to grab that pawn ever on h6. Yeah, it just opens up the king side for sure, and that file will not be a happy one to open for white. And Well, Anna, in this position, queen a5 was just played, and you know sometimes white plays a4, it puts a bishop on a3. Doesn't seem so realistic right now with the bishop on f4 like this, but I think that's the essential thing because white has the two bishops and is the only player with a dark square bishop. So if somehow this bishop can get on a more useful diagonal, black could be in huge trouble. I agree with you that normally that bishop would be very happy on a3, but now look, that pawn has been taken on a3 after rook to g1. Yeah, that's, um, that's a risky decision by black, but... Maybe not. If you can just take that pawn and start rolling your A pawn down the board, you'll be very happy. I mean, this is... I... Yeah, we shall see. Let, let's have a look at the rest of the boards once again in this match. And by the way, Greg is with us. Shout out to Pro Chess League Commissioner Greg Shahari. And he's saying that Nubarshat has been sitting in his seat and designing hotels. Yes, that was the information given by Greg. That's why he spent some time in the opening. So yeah, right now, yes, he was actually swimming in his bathtub, figuring out maybe his next hotel design. That's really funny. <laughs> um, so which game should we move on to? We'll, we'll keep an eye on this one, but which game do you want to move on to from here? I think if we just take a brief look at all the boards and have an evaluation on how the match is going okay. so far between the Phoenix and the Movers. Okay, so let's pull, I pulled up the game between Diptai and Ghosh and Mikhail Kuznetsov. And, well, there's a lot of tension in the center here, Anna, with uh, white having two pawns being able to capture on d5 on the next turn. But it looks like black can just take this pawn on c4 right now. And that looks like a free pawn. Yeah, I like free stuff. And it has just been captured. I wonder what is white's idea in this situation. Was that, what were the last moves, actually? Yeah, let's look at that. So I'm back to move 11, knight e5, knight f to d7. It's a very common move when a knight gets on e5 to move your f knight. Yes, you're moving the piece for a second time, but you need the knight on b8 to protect c6. So after knight d7, knight d7, knight d2, rook c8 and e4, forgetting about the diagonal. So black made the move knight to b6, and well, if you move that c pawn, you lose your rook on f1. So that looks like it was a big blunder playing Yeah, so one move four. blunder for getting about the pin. Yeah, and then that's a free pawn for Diptai and Ghosh here. That would be a nice win for the movers. Of course, uh, much higher rated is Diptai and Ghosh, 25-48 versus 22-36. But still, winning with the black pieces against a strong player like Kuznetsov is never a give me. It's a, it's a very difficult task. True. So this is board one of the movers versus board four of the Phoenix. And the, the opposite situation where board one of the Phoenix is playing, that's the game we have just seen where Ronak Sadvani, Indian prodigy, is playing with the white pieces against board one of the Phoenix, that is Dimitri Kravkin. And I still love Black's position. He has, uh, the H5 has been opened up. That means that white has taken at some point on H6, yep. which is a move that we didn't really recommend. And now the queen is coming to the king side too. Although to attack. that D5 pawn, Anna, that's one of the critical squares in the French and why you have that pawn E6, but that pawn took a pawn on F5 earlier in the game. Now can white just pile up pressure and go for like queen G2? Oh, there it was, played queen G2. Run said one. Yeah, that's instantly. a double attack. And I'm really struggling to see how can black get out of this? He plays queen H8. Okay. I, I put the move. But queen. wait a second. Now if there are multiple trades on D5, the problem for black is that when the queen takes, that's a check. So there's no rook takes H2. Oh, yeah. So if, so if white just plays knight takes D5, you're saying there's no rook takes h2. So knight d5, bishop d5, and if you take again on d5, then you're right that the queen takes d5 is with 
check, but maybe can black sacrifice the exchange with rook takes h2 check, queen h2, and then bishop takes d5 check, saying, please have my rook. Now with yeah. my bishop on the light squares, your king, I'm going to throw my queen back to g8. Your king is going to be in huge danger here, and then I'm going to start pushing my a pawn, and that can be used as a decoy while I launch my attack. A very interesting potential sacrifice here. This must be his idea. I'm pretty sure that that's what the, the Russian Grandmaster is planning here. And I'm curious if Ronak will enter this, oh. what other options he has. Well, he did it. he's going for it. Bishop takes d5. We, we'll see what's going on. If Rook takes e3, Bishop takes e6 is a check. So Black cannot sacrifice the exchange that way. Yep. I think we're going to see this line with Knight takes d5, Knight takes d5, Rook takes h2 check. And I kind of um, think it's forced because otherwise you just lost this pawn on d5 for black. And once you lose d5, c4 is falling next, and your king is feeling much more open because the queen on g2, once that bishop moves from d5, will go to b7. So he took on d5, knight takes, and I really think rook takes h2, it, and there it is, played. Yeah, it has to be played before knight f6 appears on the board, so we are about to see the line that Robert mentioned earlier. Yeah, and actually Greg Shadi just said that um, Brown X had won, he got his first GM norm a couple days ago, so congratulations mm. to him. Very strong player, uh, but right now he's facing a tough GM opponent in Dmitry Kuryavkin. Anna, you are a French player, so I'm going to keep deferring to you. Look at the trade. Ooh, he's going for the queen trade. So he's going to go bishop e4 now, and okay, so can you help us out here? In this endgame, black has a, a knight and one pawn for the rook, but can you kind of Give us a hint that, like, what are the themes here and who is actually better in a position like this? I think Black went for the end game because he's saying that after a5, he has a protected possible and the c2 pawn is about to drop, or White will have to protect it passively with rook a2 or rook to c1. Now, instead of that, he's going for activity with rook b1, attacking the b6 pawn. And now that it's defended, I'm curious if he wants to play rook b2. Well, he goes for it, but. It's really a passive position, and if black can activate his knight, if the knight could be placed on d5, that would be already a dream scenario. The thing is, how do you get to d5 without being captured on the way to d5? That's a great point and very instructional. Is if that knight was on d5, I honestly think that black is, maybe winning is a bit strong, but black is much better. Because yes. if my knight's on d5, you have to protect c3. And if you have to protect c3, you have to do it passively with like bishop to d2, and black blockades the entire position. So it's going to be very interesting to see how these next few moves unfold. And look at that knight. Now is the f4 square. And bishop on d6 looks good. But what's it doing? Mm -hmm. It's not attacking anything. OK, king to g3. Now do you play f4 check and maybe start pushing your past f pawn? It's a double pawn, a double isolated pawn. But you can start pushing it. You can play for a4 and then b5 and just put all your pawns on light squares, saying if you move your bishop from d6, maybe at some moment I'll play for uh, an a a4, a3 push. I'm really liking Black's chances here, although I think White probably can hold with best play. Yes, and if we just look at the position from White's perspective, if he has any chance for attacking, uh, I wanted to point out that, for instance, activating the White King, trying to infiltrate Black's position, how far would that White King need to go in order to enter Black's camp? You need to go King H4, King H5, King H6, King H7, and then the GA square. But it's not going to happen ever now that the Bishop from E4 is covering the H7 square. So there's like a barrier between Black's camp and the White camp, and white, the White King cannot cross. It can go to H5 and H6, but that's all. Right. That's definitely true. The King cannot enter to even attack any of Black's pawns, which is really nice. Black can perhaps even throw a move pawn to f5 check here. I don't know if I would do that, but the point is after pawn to mm -hmm. f5, if you take me, uh, then en passant, then you lose your bishop on d6. But I like this decision just to go f3 and keep that pawn on f7. Easier to defend there, keeps the knight on e6 very stable. And well, I'm not sure either side is gonna be able to make progress, at least not for the near future. Although knight f4 now, is that possible? Knight of four. Okay, he went f five. So he... he went. He goes f five, and White has offered a draw a few moves ago. So thirteen-year-old Ronak Swadwani doesn't lack confidence for sure. And there's Rook b one, trying to get that Rook into the game. The Bishop on d six now covers the pass pawns on the queen side. So 
Ron X had one is trying to get that rook over to maybe h1 and then it's a h6 or the h8. So the rook is trying to swing across the board here. This will be very interesting to see how this game concludes. But both players do have plenty of time left. So if there is another interesting game, on it, feel free to take us there. Otherwise, we can sit on this one since it is such an interesting end game. I think we can stay here. I just wanted to mention that, of course, today's big clash will be the match of the Armenia Eagles versus the Tbilisi Gentlemen. The top two teams are facing each other today, but that match is going to start in a few minutes. We will focus on that once the match begins. And for now, I'm behind the scenes information from Greg Shahadi that board one of the Gentlemen, Badur Jabava, is ready and he's already dancing <laughs> like he's at a club. So he must be listening to some really upbeat music. Or he's listening to our commentary and he's like, wow, Anand Robert, really great stuff. <laughs> I hope stuff. not, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I think he's probably just listening to some music here. And all right, well, you know, it's a very interesting day of action. As you mentioned, we have the Armenian Eagles and the gentlemen. I will bring up the standings really quickly just to show everybody who's in first in this Eastern Division. This is all standings before this week's action. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you go on the Pro Chess League website, you'll see the Atlantic and Pacific Division updates after their matches. But right here, right now, we see that the Eastern Division is led by the gentlemen of Tbilisi and the Armenian Eagles in a close second, but they're way ahead of the rest of the pack. So gentlemen, Eagles, today is for first place, supremacy in the Eastern Division. Yes, and your good friend Nika Volkov will be playing on board for that's a reminder from Nebulars in the chat. Shout out to everyone who has already joined us here. This is the Pro Chess League, one of the last regular matches. Then we have, I believe, one more week with regular matches and a battle royale to finish week 10. That's all. That's all that the teams have left to qualify for the playoffs. I'm curious to see which teams will make it, actually. Absolutely. And these Mumbai movers, as we saw in the standings, they're in fourth place. But right now, this game between Sadwani and Kriyakin, I think, is taking a turn for the worst for Sadwani. Knight h3 check forces that king onto the first rank. And then black can mm. go ahead and take this pawn on c2. And so let's say king, king f1, bishop c2. Next is bishop d3 check, followed by f2. And my pawn looks like it's promoting. I think so. I think black is winning, just like you said, Robert. So there must have been a blunder earlier. The position wasn't easy to play, of course. It was at least a draw the whole time for black. And then after f5, f4, Knight g5, it started looking very suspicious. Maybe simply he had to uh, prevent knight h3 with rook h1, but somehow he didn't think about that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Just rook to h1 stopped knight h3 check and allowed that rook some activity. So rook h1 is a weird oversight by such a strong player. He's very young. We can forgive him. He's going to play many excellent games of chess in his career ahead of him. But rook h1 stopping black's clear threat of knight h3. And I'm, I'm surprised that he did not find this. And maybe he was worried about bishop to d5 at knight e4 check. But still, that, that's not stopped by playing this bishop e7 move because you're forcing this knight to h3 to check. And now f2 check comes. And well, OK, as we said, bishop takes c2, followed by bishop to d3. Or here, the immediate bishop g2. And black just simply queens. Yeah, what's surprising is that Ronak is playing extremely quickly. So even though he was in a very difficult position and now it's already lost, he didn't spend time trying to figure out the defense. And maybe for now that could be one of his weaknesses that he's playing sometimes way too fast. Yeah, definitely. That's uh, that might be a big problem for him. Uh, but you know, he's like we keep talking. About, he's young. He will have time to fix some of these problems that he may face right now. And mm -hmm. well, black just gets the queen, goes up a minor piece. And perhaps there's still a bit of a technical task ahead because this bishop on e7 is an opposite color bishop to white. And black's pawns can't move, at least not for the immediate future. So black will need to find a way to get this knight from h3 into a square like e4 to attack the c3 pawn. But the knight on h3 is kind of trapped over here. So is the bishop on f1. So it is a curious situation here. Although I think uh, white is in a bit of a zugzwang because um, this bishop on e7 needs to stay uh, with this a, mm -hmm. a pawn. So perhaps I can even play this move knight to g5 because you can't take me in some lines as my pawn will break free. So um, yeah, this looks like Kriyavkin will pull away with this victory. Yes, but you're right. This is still a curious position. I'm going to try to create some hype already in the chat, guys. Pull out those pro chess league emotes. And also, I think in the honor of Robo Hess, we got to 
We gotta use the bagel emote. Robert, are you ready for another double shift today? No, thankfully no double shift today. <laughs> uh, I love doing commentary. So for everyone who's watching and who's seen me do, I don't even know how many of the last shifts, just tons of double shifts this month, but uh, I will be heading to Boston immediately after we do our commentary. We finish up here because I'll be attending the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. There's a panel on chess that I'm a part of, and it's, it's a great honor for me. And so long story short, no, I will not be doing double duty today. <laughs> But, you know, if I'll ask you more about the panel later on. But for now, what we are witnessing is that, yes, Black is converting this into a full point. So board one of the Phoenix is going to be board four of the movers. Let's just have a look at the opposite, where Dip Tayangosh, board one of the movers, is playing against Kuznetsov, board four of the Phoenix. Okay, so Black is still up that pawn. But this last move, rook to b8, well, I see a bishop on a four and a rook on b8, but... So I would say knight takes c4 seems to be the most obvious reply as uh, well. Yes, that's why I wanted to come back because I didn't know what's going on with the discovered attack. Robert, are you as puzzled as me? Is What's going on after knight takes? Oh, he just wants to play queen takes and the b1 rook is hanging to but if queen, queen c4. Queen c4, rook takes b1 check. And if I take you on b1, yeah. then you're like, what if I drop my queen back to c1 there? Is that a possibility? Perhaps that way you take my queen, mm -hmm. I take back, and now you have some issues in the c6 square? Is that uh, at least keeping mm. white in the game despite being down a pawn? I think that's the worst, um, not worst, excuse me, the best of a worst case scenario for white is that I'm down that pawn, I know it, but at least with my rook on c1, your c6 pawn's not going anywhere and it is quite a target. Hmm, might be the case, but let's just have also a brief look at board two and board three in the very same match so that we can evaluate if the movers or the Phoenix are doing better at the moment. Okay, so Nubair, uh, this is Mohammed Nubair Sha uh, Shaikh, the underwater hotel specialist with the, the white liner, pieces. Designer, yes. Oh, I like white's position in this game. It's even material, but white is just a bit more active, and black's pawns on the queen side are more vulnerable than any of white's on the king side. Yes, I think he's doing well. I like White's activity. Having the rook on the seventh rank is always great. The question is, is there more than just a small pressure? How can White improve his position? Mm, no, nah, I, don't, I don't really think that it's much more than a s small uh, symbolic advantage because uh, how do you actually attack any of Black's pieces? Like This Black Queen can always go from E8 to E6 or something like that. Uh, perhaps you can even... Tr and actually... Um, Mohammed Sheikh offered a draw here with the white pieces. And oh. if I'm D Demidov, I'm certainly accepting it. Black is in no way even close to being better. Maybe he missed the offer. Oh, but look at this. Yeah, he may not have seen it or he is just going to go wide with G5. I mean, what, <laughs> what's the plan? He, he's on the defensive side of this game and he's not accepting the draw. It's time. I just noticed that Mohammed Sheikh has less than a minute left, so perhaps Demidov's hoping to flag the guy, but wow. I mean, White has no weaknesses. The queen on d4 is perfect, so a very strange situation. Actually, we saw a game has just finished. That is, that board won. Detai and Ghosh won that game um, with the black pieces up the pawn, so he ended up being up two minor pieces, it seems, and that turned into an easy victory. Yeah, so it's 1-1 one, one at the moment, and Nubar Shock is really down on the clock. I didn't realize earlier that there's such a huge difference in time. He's playing queen d7 to trade queens and go for an equal rook end game. Queen e4 check. Now, well, the king can go basically anywhere if he wants to allow a perpetual. Yeah, it could go pawn f3 even as an option, but then queen mm -hmm. to c2 check. So I think he's just going to uh, keep his king g1, but look, white is still more active here. I mean... Black, I understand Black declined the draw offer, but I don't think Black has any winning chances whatsoever. And if you're not careful as Demidov and you try to play this too long, you could see yourself becoming worse as this rook from a7 might go to c7. You still can't move your rook away from f8 with the f7 pawn hanging. So it's just a bit passive for Black for the time being. And I understand why he's playing for the clock, but at a certain moment, you might have to be a little bit more realistic and say, okay, I can't really move my pieces anywhere. Um, True. Let's just switch to board two of the movers because I think he's in deep trouble. Puranik, isn't he about to get mated? Whoa. He has just pushed f6, but his king is really shaky. Yeah. So let's see the material for a second. Black is up a piece for two pawns, but this rook is coming e3 and trying to quickly come to h3. And a big problem for black, Anna, is that if your queen tries to run to the, the king side, 
then you lose your C6 pawn and your A5 pawn and then your E4 pawn. So even if you're able to somehow trade the queens off, um, you're in, still in trouble. And actually, you can't move your knight without losing F6. So it looks like you're absolutely correct here that black is probably just lost. I don't see even a defensive move here that can save the game because a move like knight to b6, well, then your pieces look silly over there, and I could still go bishop takes c6, saying your queen can't leave the seventh rank, otherwise I swiftly deliver a checkmate. Mm -hmm. So it's just- I completely agree with you. I don't see a defense against rook h3. And once the knight moves, even the f6 pawn will be in the air. So this is looking hopeless for Poranik. He is the higher rated player here. So we are witnessing the first upset of the day. Takeya winning with the white pieces. Yep. And yeah, it's very nice for Takeya. But I actually don't know who this player is. And that's a really the cool thing at the pro chess thing for me, because I follow mm -hmm. a lot of chess, like a ton of chess. But then I'm, yeah. I'm still finding new names, very strong players who are kind of hidden behind all the elite players we see at all these other events. So it's really cool to see a player like Takiev here uh, play such interesting chess, and he's defeating a much stronger, a uh, much higher rated, I don't, don't want to say stronger, but a higher rated player in Abimanyu Pironik. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out more about him. Uh, I think he is only 23 or 24 years old, the FIDE master from Russia, but I also haven't heard about him before. So that's really a cool feature of the Pro Chess League, as you said, Robert. Now, Rook E7 trying to defend in the second rank after Rook H3, Queen H8, the H8 square, Black cannot protect, simply just cannot. Yeah, this is not looking pleasant. Um, I've faced worse attacks in my life, but this is definitely not uh, one of the fun ones to see because your king is just never finding shelter. The, the immediate threat is queen h8 followed by rook h7 with checkmate. Your king can, can't even run to f7. As soon as you buy king f7, queen g6 check comes followed by rook h8 mate after king to f8. So I think black is just getting checkmated in the next couple moves and it's yeah, just not fun here. Uh, okay, rook g7. Not fun at all. G5, look at that move. After f takes g5, he wants to play f6. Yeah. Or queen e6. Both look very tempting. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those positions where actually it's sometimes difficult because if you don't see the knockout win, you're like thinking, I have so many options, you start spending your time, and white only has a minute and a half. Granted, the position is so good here, but you mm -hmm. start wasting too much time. I don't say wasting, but you start using too much time. Then you're left with not enough time to really calculate as um, you feel the pressure that you're not winning the game anymore, and that's a psychological burden. But here, of course, white doing so well. But black is now up a pawn. So we should keep that in the back of our minds. Okay, queen e6 check has to be winning. Like it, it has Yes, to be. and if king f8, rook aj, so black has to play queen to f7 after queen e6 check, but that looks queen, bad. Yeah, to queen c8 queen check, c8. queen f8, and rook aj check. Oh, and you win the queen with rook aj, so it's game over. Uh, behind the scenes information that Puranik is actually the highest puzzle rush rated player from India. Thank you, Sam, for that fun fact. He has scored 50 in puzzle rush, and right behind him is Vidit Gujarati with 49 points. So 50, that's a really cool score in puzzle rush. Not as good as Hikaru's 55, but well, it's very, it's definitely a lot more than what I can do in puzzle rush. <laughs> Anna, I'm going to take us quickly to this Nuber um, Shah game because, um, excuse me, Mohammed Nuber Shah Shaikh, because look at this. All of a sudden, both sides are queening, but black is queening oh. with check. And so black wins this game. I said Demidov had no chance. Well, he knew what he was doing. He said, Robert Hess, you have no idea what you're talking about. And so <laughs> leave the chess playing to me. You just talk about the other games, but not mine, because all of a sudden we see that Mikhail Demidov wins with the black pieces, and, well, he just got his opponent to time trouble, traded off the queen, and said, my king is better suited in the end game. And, well, we're already on to new games, but I was trying to show that end game. But, okay, back to the Abimanyu Pironic game. It's not over until it's over, but a move like Rook E1 or Rook H6 check. I would play Rook E1, bringing another piece into an attack. But if there's a force checkmate, okay, Queen G6 check. This has to be made in a few moves. Probably Puranik knows it. Yeah. He's the puzzle rush champion of India. Yeah, now it's made. Yeah. It's over. Queen e8, next move. So this is a nice win by Tekayev, an upset. Yep. Board three of the Phoenix beating board two of the movers. But they did go down on the other board where we thought that Damidov had no winning chances. Yeah. No, but that, that's actually 
even better for the Phoenix, right? Yes. So they have won. They have won the first round. Yeah, three to one. So that's pretty crazy. So uh, Cash Maggie says Shake Shake was winning, but end up drowning in time trouble. That's funny. It's, again, the underwater <laughs> hotel references. So I see that other match that's going on here is. Uh, we see oddly for the Delhi Dynamite, he's a free agent for them. He's a very strong Egyptian player. He's playing Andre Skvortsov. And wait, isn't isn't there like a famous sponsor and organizer Skvortsov at Oleg? Is that right? Yes. I was wondering if it's the same family, maybe the son. I'm gonna try to figure it out. Yeah, interesting to see that. But and Skor- Mr. Skvortsov is the sponsor of the Zurich Chess Festival, isn't he? Yeah. The rapid matches that uh, are being organized every year. Yes, indeed, and I don't. I don't know if it's a relationship. I just saw the last name and I was like, "Oh, this is curious." But okay. Yeah, I thought of the same. In this game here, in this ending, well, black is up a rook for a bishop, but there are not that many pawns left. But that said, what's really good? This is going to come down to is if black is going to be able to get a pass pawn and have it move. And right now, I don't see a way to protect this g3 pawn in a useful manner because if you play king to f3. Your pieces are all sort of stuck to each other. So black can pretty much make any move king to b6, saying, well, I, I, I guess point taken. That what's white going to do here? You put your pawn to h4. What's your next move after that? OK, h4 played. And if I'm black, do I play king to e6 and just move my king to the queen side? As the e3 pawn is immune to capture because you lose your g3 pawn. And once g3 falls, h4 or a3 will be next. So OK, he's going straight for the a3 pawn. But this should be winning for Ahmed Adli, just a matter of technique at this point. Yeah, and at the same time, I was trying to figure out something about Mr. Skortov. Andrei Skortov is 22 years old, so judging by the age, he could well be the son of Oleg Skortov. But this is just my theory. Maybe Skortov is actually just a very popular surname. I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea but I trust you more than I trust myself when it comes to these things. I'm going to go away from this game because I see the game between Vasily Usmanov with the black piece against Rishi Sardana, and it looks like a huge attack is coming for the white side. Because we started in a French defense, of course white is crashing through and um, devastating sorry? black's forces here. Um, you know, French just don't have that, that much activity. You have a silly light square bishop, and here <sighs> you have no kingside pawns to defend as the move h5 is very likely to appear right now saying, well, you, I'm going to go h5. You can feel free to go queen to f8 to try to trade queens, but I'm going to just retreat my queen to mo- square like f4 or to c1 even, doesn't matter. And then I'm going to take your knight on g6 and still try to checkmate you. So queen f8 was played here. Do not trade queens. There you go, queen to g5. Take on g6 next. And black is, at the very best, going to be down a pawn in a queenless endgame, but it looks even worse than that from my point of view right now. I agree with you, Robert, that the position at the moment is not looking good for black, but it wasn't the fault of the opening. We all know that. (laughs) All right, I'll let you continue to pretend like that's the case, but this would be a nice win here (laughs) for the Dynamax. See, Tanya Sachdev, she lost her game to Boris Savchenko, but okay, he's the uh, top board, I believe, for the Moscow. Yes, of the Wizards. Wizards. Tanya is playing on board four for the Dynamite. She's a really strong board four player. I'm, I'm expecting her to score a couple of points today, but board one is, of course, her her biggest um, difficulty yes. when we are facing the highest rated opponent from the opponent's team. So I'm sure that Tanya will be doing better in the next games. Yep. And I see that actually Abhijit Gupta lost his game to Karanki for the Moscow oh. Wizards. So that's a, a big upset there. All right. Uh, you know, being... A 2460 IM with the white pieces, of course, you could pull off victories over 2590 GMs, but Abhishek Gupta is one of the steadier forces in the Pro Chess League. So that's um, a not an ideal start for the Delhi Dynamite as they go down 2 0 in the early going to the Wizards. Yeah, by the way, I'm loving this new feature by chess.com, the way the result appears. It's so fancy. Yeah, I like it a lot. Just like in your face, but like in a very nice way. And when you play yeah. a game, you see your rating go up or down as if it's just like happening in real time. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I really like it. I think it looks very nice when you win a game and you're happy that your face is in the green box. Uh, Maybe when you lose after blundering terribly, then it's not so cool, but we shall see. Absolutely. And so someone just asked, have we checked out the game Volkov versus Andreasian? And the answer is no. And I'm going to try to find that game right now. 
but where is that game? Um, um, oh, there. Volkovi with the white pieces. That is your good friend, Nika Volkov. Looks great for him right now. Yes. He's up. A this is board four of the gentleman versus board one of the Eagles, the defending champions. And I'm loving that rook on d6, the knight in the center, supported by the other knight and the e5 pawn. This is a brilliant position. Yeah, actually, I thought that white was up a pawn <coughs> based on how good the position looked, but it's even material. But the big problem for black is if these, if you lose your knight or if he gets traded, you know, that's going to more likely you're not going to lose it. But you trade the knights, then your f4 pawn is weak, your h4 pawn is weak, and that rook on d6 is a beautifully placed, like you said, Anna. And like, let's imagine knight takes f3, knight takes f3, bishop e6. White might just follow up with bishop to c4, saying, well, the light squares are going to be under my control. I'm certainly going to dominate them, as if you take me on c4 and I take with my queen, you have a dark square bishop, whereas I have a knight. And my knight at some point is going to get into the game. I'm going to try to play e6 myself. A rook takes g6 tactics are available because the f7 pawn is pinned. So I think black is going to immediately find himself under huge pressure. And Nika Volkov is going to try to land a tremendous upset that is not as big as the ratings suggest because Nika Volkov, as we've all seen throughout the season, is a 2500 rapid player. But his classical rating is 2100, so it's quite misleading and he's probably the best uh, board four in the entire league. I think so too, especially taking into account that this is a shorter time control. So Nika Volkov is a great choice for the gentleman having low rating, but much higher performance and much higher knowledge, if we can call this is different skill, a rapid and blitz chess. I think this is a very tough game for Andresian. He's also somewhat below on the clock. We got to check how is the other board one doing? That's Badur Jobava for the gentleman. Whoa. Yeah, I just pulled up that game, and it's just so many pieces, it hurts my eyes. And before we continue, <laughs> on, I want to pull up a quote by Anna Sargisian here. And that quote sure. is, what's your favorite chess book? Positional Decision Making in Chess by Boris Gelfand. A great book. Uh, Boris Gelfand, of course, a legendary chess player himself, a former world championship challenger against Vishya Anand. But that is uh, good to see that you know, she's keeping up with her uh, reading in the chess world. She's a very, very strong player, by the way, at 23-30 uh, with her rating for the Pro Chess League, a very talented board four, and Armenia Eagles will, of course, rely on her to score some upset points in this matchup against the division-leading Tbilisi gentleman. I think that she's doing very well in this game, and yes, she's really strong. I was wondering why her title is Woman Freedom Master. Probably she's just waiting f to score her remaining Woman Grandmaster norms because 2300 is a Woman Grandmaster rating. Yes, yes. No, she's very strong, and she's going to be getting more titles than that because she's also quite young, if I'm not mistaken. She's a teenager and has shown tremendous progress. She's on the Armenian women's team, and when I was visiting Armenia, she came by and was uh, hanging out mm -hmm. with all the players and playing blitz and things like that. So you know, clearly chess is a humongous part of her life and it shows, her results do emphasize that point. Yeah, I'm loving that knight on f5. That's usually very cool when you can place your knight so close to the opponent's king. And g6 is always difficult to be pushed because you can see that in this moment, the h6 pawn would fall. So black has to uh, prepare this move if he wants to play g6, king h7. Uh, but even then, I like White's position a lot, so it is even White to move here. And the question I'm asking myself is, do I play Queen G4 or do I play Queen H5? I just want to get my Queen into the attack. Now, there are some downsides that you have to be careful about. So I'll give you one example. Let's say I go Queen mm -hmm. to H5. Okay, G6 is not possible. Your H6 pawn, as you just discussed, is hanging. But let's say I take on F4. And when someone takes on F4, you tend to want to take with the pawn so that you don't give the E5 square to an enemy piece. But if you do take with the G pawn, at some point you're going to be very concerned about your E4 pawn, as black will have the resource bishop takes F, excuse me, C3. The bishop's on F6, bishop takes mm -hmm. C3, so that the E4 pawn is starting to feel more and more vulnerable. Now, of course, after bishop's three pawn takes knight F6, I'm already attacking the E4 pawn a second time. I'm attacking your queen on H5. So that's putting immediate pressure on that centralized pawn and if white isn't delivering an attack white could see um, herself becoming in quick trouble she played queen g4 with the immediate threat of knight takes h6 due to the pin i believe that jabala will move his king out king h7 now g6 is a possibility in the future mm -hmm. 
Uh, I get... Although a knight takes h6 and f takes e5, perhaps one in black shouldn't go there. Yeah, and if I'm and now I'm thinking, do I play queen h5 or queen h3? Just to pretend. Maybe it's not even a pretend. Maybe it's a legitimate threat. But if my queen is on h3, then perhaps I'm threatening to take on e5 and sacrifice a piece on the h6 square, right? Mm -hmm. Because that king's on h7, which means once I take on h6, with my queen will be a check. So if queen h3, and let's say you play some. Let's just make a really weird move, like rook to b8, no, a nonsensical move. I could take on e5, and after you take back on e5, say with the knight, then I go, I take on h6 with my knight, and all of a sudden I'm taking back with the queen, with check, your bishop on f6 is hanging, everything's opening up in a pretty devastating fashion. Yes, I like what White's chances a lot, and that means that in this match between the gentleman and the eagles, both board fours are doing very well in this first game that's supposed to be the most difficult for the lower rated players. Yep. Yeah, no, I mean, she's just a very strong board four. And a knight b5, very typical move here, saying, go ahead, take my knight on b5, give me double pawns. But what are you going to do next? Right? Black is still very cramped. And as long as I'm not hanging my pawns in the position c4 was just under attack, White is going to eventually play for a kingside attack, and Black will have to be very, very careful. Let's once again have a quick look at the other board one's game, because that's the other really exciting position we have been discussing. Nika Volkov with the white pieces. I still think he's doing extremely well, even better than before now with the rook on the g5. This pawn on e5 is still really strong. The queen can come in with queen f5. The knight is about to capture the h4 pawn and jump to f5. Yikes. Anna, I've seen worse positions that usually stem from the French defense, but hey. <laughs> you know I have to. I'm sorry. You know, I just have to get my French jokes in now. But on a serious note, this position is so bad for black because, oh, knight g5, nice, throwing a queen h7 check. And if you go queen to g6, then I'm playing knight e4, attacking your queen on g6, throwing knight f6 check, winning your rook on e8. Black is oh. totally lost. Yeah, board one of the Eagles is going down against board four of the gentleman. What an upset. Nika Volkov has been performing extremely well for the gentleman, but this will be one of his biggest scalps in the protest league. And it's on the board. Next move, knight f6, unless black wants to give up the queen with rook takes e4 and rook takes e1. Yeah, you know, the rook takes the e4. Rook takes e4. I'm not even taking the queen. Right, just to go queen takes e4, rook takes e4. I'll take with the rook probably because your king is still yeah. in danger. And that's uh, bad news because you're right. Rook takes e4, rook g6. I was rookie one check, intermediate move, king h2, and then pawn takes g6. And black has too much material for the queen. So after rook takes e4, if that's your desperate attempt, I'll just take back with my rook, say, well, I'm up in exchange, your king is still unsafe, and I'm going to win your f4 pawn and your h4 pawn and your c5 pawn and your c6 pawn after that. So bad news for Zavin Andreasen here. Totally. Those of you who are fans of the Armenia Eagles, don't worry. This is just round one. And also, board four of the Eagles is doing extremely well against Jababa. So anything can happen. But as you know, it's all plays all. We're going to see four rounds in each match. And this is just the beginning. Anna, I see someone has 12 seconds left. Um, that is um, my Narva for the Estonia Horses. She's 13.4 mm -hmm. now. And Grigio Oparin is about to deliver what looks like a devastating attack. White's not even up material for her king troubles here, but she just plays with king oh. h2, which I think bishop b4 wins this bishop on c2. So it's, uh, unfortunately for her, she's facing one of the best speed chess players in the world in uh, Grubrio Oparin. And so she lost that game uh, for the horses, but okay. Board one versus board four matchup, totally reasonable start. You know, you want to do better, but uh, you're not too ashamed to lose to such a strong player in Oparin. Yeah. And the other female player we have been talking about is Anna Sargissian, and I still like her position a lot, perhaps even more than before after the capture on f4. If bishop takes f4, isn't it what we wanted, that the bishop is joining the attack and there's a potential sacrifice on h6? Yeah. yeah. She might be thinking whether to capture with the rook and then bring the rook to g4. She, yeah, she might be thinking that. She might be thinking knight takes h6. as saying, like, knight h6, g h6, can I go ahead and take bishop f4 now, and now the f file is open, the f7 pawn is going to be hanging in some lines. I would not play knight takes h6, but I can see why it's so tempting. Uh, you sacrifice one knight, but you're right on it. Like, why sacrifice now if you can sacrifice likely later? And f7 is also hanging in the position, uh, so that is a big problem 
for black. Trying to cover everything in this position does not seem to be easy at all. One player that would definitely know the perfect move order here, which sacrifice to play first is Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura, who has just raided us. Thank you so much, Hikaru, for the raid. And welcome everyone from the Hikaru crew. This is the Pro Chess League. We are witnessing the main clash that is between the Armenia Eagles and the Tbilisi Gentlemen in the Eastern Division. They are the top two teams. And we may see an upset. Both board fours are doing very well against board ones. You see Anna Sergisian with the white pieces, over 300 rating points lower rated than Bardur Jabava. Yeah. And she may be just winning in a very classy style, attacking chess. Yeah, and it seems Shun Rook takes F4, so I like what she's doing, bringing another piece into the attack. She's trying to go Rook to G4, and that way she can take on H6 with mating threats here. And, I mean, Anna, I'm starting to really worry about Jabawa's position because F7 is still hanging, so that pawn has not gone anywhere. The Rook on F4 defends the E4 pawn a second time, which means you can't capture it. And if you play Knight to E5, can I get away with a sacrifice on H6? Uh, that's the essential question. Or do I still have to play calm chess? You know that's hard for me, Anna, just being calm when I can sacrifice all these pieces. <laughs> but, you know, I move like bishop to maybe c3 or just rook to f1. Like, I don't know. It just, I want to sacrifice on h6. I just really want to do it. But perhaps I should be a little bit more deliberate in my intentions. I think the sacrifice will eventually happen, but we shall figure out when is the right moment. And Anna Sergisian doesn't have that much time to calculate. Uh, jo Joava at least kept some time on the clock, so it's eight minutes for the Georgian player and four and a half for Anna Sergisian. I see that unfortunately Hikaru had to stop his stream by force because he lost power. There was a power outage uh, at his place, which is really sad. I'm sorry to hear that Hikaru couldn't continue his show because of outer forces yeah but you know Hikaru is always streaming he's a great presence for the chess world of course you know his chess accomplishments speak for themselves if you need to know who Hikaru Nakamura is well I guess you uh you know you're in the right place just google Hikaru Nakamura chess and you'll find quite a lot of information about the legend that is Nakamura and make sure to follow and subscribe to his channel because he streams regularly. That is basically almost every single day. He's very dedicated to Twitch and the community. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Anna, it looks like, well, Anna Sargisian. Wow, so many Annas right now. And Volkov just won his game, by the way. So that game is over. That's a board four victory for the Twizy gentlemen over the Armenian Eagles. So are there any other games that we should, you know, keep an eye on here? Or are we going to stay with this one? I think we can stay here and also there's a question that has been asked so many times in the chat that I need to come up with it and ask you, Robert. Yeah. People are claiming that this is a pre-recorded show. We recorded it 10 years ago because you look so young, Robert. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I always joked that I was pretty much like born with a beard because I've had a beard for so long. But no, it's not pre-recorded. I did shave my beard, as you can all tell. I think that's what everyone's talking about. Um, you know, I'm doing a conference this weekend. I figured I got got to go and clean shaven. The beer will come back. Don't worry. It's a uh, it's not a look that's gonna disappear forever. So appreciate everybody being concerned if I'm uh, doing a Benjamin Button and getting younger by the day. But no. <laughs> we wish, right? We want to be Benjamin Button. I mean, yeah, that'd be pretty interesting. Uh, I'd be I'd be totally okay with that. I think maybe. I don't know. Tough tough call. Yeah. Okay, maybe just let's get stuck at the age of 25 and live on forever at the age of 25. Like, <laughs> yeah, but this... In Time, isn't it the movie In Time with uh, Justin Timberlake? Yes. That you have basically the same body, but your soul is getting older and older and older. Well, well in, ti in, ti in Time, like, is literally time is money, right? So you pay to, like, yeah. earn more time. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting concept. I, I really like that movie, actually. Yeah. So that's, that's a plug watch Justin Timberlake in In Time. Well, I was thinking more a little bit sad, honestly, Tuck Everlasting. Have you, you know, seen, mm. seen that or read the, read the book? It's pretty, yeah. pretty upsetting stuff about immortality and how you know, everyone around you is not immortal. But uh, yeah, so on a yeah. happier note, you know, hopefully these chess players are not immortal on the board because we do want to see some cool, decisive games here. And Anna, I'm, I'm going to have to say I'm getting more concerned about on a Sargissian's position here because her pieces look a little bit dysfunctional on 
G4 and H3, and black is playing very normal chess here, going for the E4 pawn. Um, yeah, she may have missed the right moment to go for a sacrifice on h6 because after queen f8, now everything is well protected and black has managed to double rooks on the e file. Yes, the rook is trapped on e5, but I think he was going to give up an exchange anyway, so he plays rook takes f5. Yeah, the big problem here is, now, is that white is very far from the queen side, so like a move like queen e7, going to e3 and taking all those pawns. Looks good, rook to e3 right away. Yeah. And suddenly this queen that was attacking on the h file is now just uh, out of the game because of being placed on h3. Yeah, she's a bystander to the action. And hmm. right now, this bishop on g2 is a very terrible piece. And this goes to show how knights can dominate bishops. This bishop on g2 has no future whatsoever. There's no diagonal to work with, whereas these knights can hop around the board. This knight on d7 go to f6 or to e5. Then if it goes from e5, maybe eventually go to c4. More immediately, c3 is hanging. Queen e7 can be a follow-up. So it doesn't even seem like white has a plan here, whereas black has a million different moves that look good. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if our volume is good because I see a few comments about the audio, but unless we are getting advised by the chess.com team that we should change something with the microphone setting, I think we are all, all right. I don't know, Robert, if you see any feedback on that. I'll ask, but you know, sometimes it's not actually on us, it's on the people watching. So people say, yep, <laughs> you see the person goes, oh, <laughs> okay. oh sorry, yes, it's me. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's the thing is I, I'm totally with you, Anna. I like you know, to make sure that things are going well and smoothly, but sometimes it really, yeah. and I'm not blaming anybody, but I know from experience when I've watched things, I say, wait, something's wrong with this. And then, you know, um, someone tells you, you just got to refresh your page or something like that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, totally. So, yeah, thank you guys for confirming it. I see that for that one feedback on the low audio now, we have 10 others saying that everything is great. Shout out to our moderators, by the way, coffee, tea. Chess Bay, welcome to the stream. I'm so happy to see you guys. Coffee and tea. And the Pug. The Pug is the new crew member. I'm going to show you guys later the entire studio because I will be streaming tonight, actually, after the second Pro Chess League. Oh, yes, you will be. I can't wait to uh, be trolling in the comments on your stream later then. Um, oh, I'm going to play the French defense in every single game of mine, Robert. Be ready for that. All right. Well, on that note, not tuning in anymore because I don't like feeling nauseous. So. Uh. <laughs> 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 sorry, Anna. I'm sorry. I, I, forgive me. Oh, also, speaking of Anna, I mean, we have to stay on this game because I like what White just did, by the way. And after Rook E3, she played this move pawn to f6, which is in a very intelligent pawn sacrifice. And the reason why mm -hmm. is if you don't go f6 and black had the opportunity to play knight f6, you're just keeping the position very closed and rooks need open files. So do bishops, they need open diagonals. So knight f6 was played. She then played rook, other rook to f1. And so now their ideas with sacrifices on f6. Queens are another piece that need open diagonals and files. Queen c8 is an option here to be aggressive. And by putting your queen, there she goes. And by going queen c8, maybe she can go bishop h3 and then bring this bishop to f5 with check, trying to force the move pawn to g6, in which case the knight on f6 has lost its protection. So on a Sargissian, f6 is a very, very classy move here, a pawn sacrifice to open up lines for her pieces. And if she not only survives this game, but even maybe potentially goes on to win, she's earned it with that move pawn to f6. She may have lost her attack, but that is such a high level move, pawn f6. I completely agree with you. She has fought her way back into the game. It's a little bit uh, difficult to see that she's down to one minute against such a strong and quick player as Badur Jababa, but definitely f6 was an amazing move, very classy. And after knight d3, she's going to move the rook away. I, think I wonder if she should go for rook d4, force Ooh. the knight back to c5, or rook f3. She has gone rook f3, but that allows knight d1. I'm not sure that this was a good trade. If the bishop disappears from g2, her king will be weaker. Yeah, I thought she could have played rook takes a4 in that position, right? If she played rook takes a4, that rook's going to a8, and then queen h8 check oh, is going to okay. be pretty annoying. So she, yeah. she went rook f3, she's playing a bit defensively, but she's still definitely in this game. But now um, her king is clearly much more vulnerable than it was a moment ago. Although she's, you know, it's not like black has a clear, easy path to victory either. So it's still an interesting battle. I'm going to keep an eye out on this one and just see checking. I see Archer Gabrielian is 21 seconds. So we can hop over there 
really quickly as he has a pass pawn on b6 against Levon Pantsulaya. And, I mean, what's going on here? That pawn just looks like it's going to promote, except are there some tactics here with knight f3 check coming? Let me catch up with you to see that game as well. Okay, that is uh, Gabrielian Arthur versus Schwartzman LP. That's Levon Pantsulaya. Yeah, I'm just looking at the position too. Ooh, so I, I, that b-pawn scares me. But I guess black can just take on e4. So like bishop takes e4 here. As you can't take with the knight on e4, otherwise knight f3 check wins your rook on e1. So you take with the rook on e4. And after we trade rooks, I have knight f3 check. Knight takes e5. Knight to c6 to stop your pawn from promoting. So it looks like black's knight mm -hmm. gets back just in time for Pantsulaya here. Yeah, totally. So this is an important game, of course, in this match. We have already emphasized how important it is for the gentlemen and the Eagles. They are the top two teams in the Eastern Division. And yes, it's likely that both teams will qualify for the playoffs, but it also matters if we are first, second, third or fourth, because the higher your team is, the better it is for you. So in the playoff, the system is a knockout system. And in case of an 8-8, the team that collected more points in the regular season will move on when it's a tie. So 8-8 will favor always the team that finishes first in this case or second in the group. Yes, no, that's a very important point. So you know, it's not just about making the playoffs, it's about improving your seeding as well. Very, very good point. And while well, Archer Gabrielian here will play B7, Black will play knight to c6 to stop the pawn. White will then play knight f6 check, take this d7 pawn, get a queen. But unfortunately for white, a knight cannot mate a lone king, in which case you know, you'll go up the knight, black will have two pawns remaining, and it will just be a draw in the near future. So this was a looks like a well-fought game here between these two grandmasters, very strong players for the eagles and the gentlemen. And OK, well, this game is coming to its conclusion. In the same match earlier, we were witnessing how Nika Volkov, the board four of the gentlemen, was outplaying board one of the Eagles, Davin Andresian. And indeed, that's a victory for Nika Volkov, one very important score for the gentlemen. Yep. And let's we'll see if Badur Jabawa can help Nika Volkov add to the Tbilisi point total here. As with the black pieces, he is, I will say down, but I'm going to put that in quotes, down in exchange, because <laughs> he has how many pawns? He has seven pawns to white's four. That is a ton of pawns. But black's having a bit of difficulty here because those pawns can't really move too easily. right? The c7 pawn and b6 pawns, two pawns, are stuck by one white pawn. Mm -hmm. On the In the center, you can't go d4 because my rook is well-placed to cover the d4 square, and you can't really move your knight away from c5 or else you lose the a4 pawn. So Anna Sargissian still in this game. If I'm Badur Jabava, maybe I play knight e4 to d6. But still, if I'm losing that a4 pawn, I'm not a happy camper. And I don't even see ooh, f5. I'm taking that Yeah, he's side. going for this trade, trying to create an h pass pawn later with g5. But this also opens some fights for the rook. And the, the king is coming in, king d4. That's very well played. And now the rook coming in, rook b1, next move can be rook e1, rook f1, rook g1. I think white has more than enough activity. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, um, d4 check, I think you go king to, you can't go king c4, I was at the blunder in exchange because the knight d2 check. But after d4, mm. maybe king b4, and I try to take your a4 pawn again. Or just play king d3 and sit in front of the pawn. That's an issue with a knight, right? You give me one check, but you can't control multiple squares at the same time so easily. And now rook g1, she played. This is starting to turn around again, because if you go king f6, I simply go king d4 and win your d5 pawn. And once my king goes to d5, then I'm going king c6. I'm glad we stuck around in this game, Anna, because it's been a huge like, swing of events. Both white looking really much better, the black looking much better, then who knows what's happening. And in this end game, I thought it was going to be black's uh, chances only, but now all of a sudden white has the better position, I think. Yes, and Black's problem is that he has to be defending both the g6 pawn and the d5 pawn. So if the king moves to, say, let's say king f6, king f5, then white will come in with king d4. And how do you protect both of your weaknesses, these pawns? I think now we'll, white will actually start playing for a win, even though she's down to 44 seconds. Yeah, and a big problem in a rook versus a minor piece ending is if you have pawns on opposite side of the board, 
it becomes tough, especially for a knight. Knights are short-range pieces, right? A bishop on a1 covers the entire diagonal. A knight on c5, in order to get to this h-pawn, it got to go knight to e4, knight to f6, and it just takes more turns just by how the pieces move to get over there. So king e5 gives up the g6 pawn, and then oh, king e5 played, but now the h5 pawn is going to be in trouble as well. So I play rook takes g6 here, and then follow that up with a quick rook to g5, hopefully, and win this h-pawn. Um, yeah, this is this is getting really unclear here, and I think white it's been is a roller coaster game. But I think Anna Sargisian deserves the at least half a point, if not the full point, for her fighting spirit. She had a very promising attack in the middle game against Jabava. Then she was in a difficult position, but she found a way to sacrifice a pawn with f6 and activate her pieces. And even in the end game, it wasn't easy to play this as wide, but she has managed to to play, first of all, the best defensive moves and then find counterplay in the right moment. Yeah, and here rook g7 going right after that c7 pawn or trying to go rook e7 check to kick the king away from e4. That looks really good. Rook g5, we were talking about that, going for the h5 pawn and having the rook have access to the d5 square. 15 seconds left for Anna, so I'm starting to be really nervous, but she has made a move, rook g7. Yeah, she needs to move a little bit more quickly. Or take that pawn on c7, probably? N yeah. 95 check or knight b where's that knight checking me from i guess e5 check makes sense but after 95 check i just put my king to b4 and again a problem with the knight 95 check king b4 pawn d3 i go king to c3 a king th uh, on a diagonal away from a knight is always the best situation because it takes a knight forever three moves mm -hmm. to go attack my king or a piece if it's on a, a diagonal way uh, three squares away on the diagonal so c3 to e5 the knight has to go to f3 to d4 to e2 just to attack my king. So I think white is winning here as- I think so too, but both players are down to 15 seconds. So it's not just about the position, but also how fast they can play. Anna Sergisian should be winning this, but after D3, okay, D3, King, C3 still. Yep. And then I, you go D2 and I'll go King, C2. And your knight again has to stay protecting the pawn. And then I'll bring my rook to do the rest. So here comes D2, King, C2 here. Oh, rook D6 and our King, E3. Yep. Uh oh. So what's going on? Well, yeah, the problem is King C2, Knight D4 check, closing the D5. But well, then I maybe can sit on D1. King D1. Okay, so I. Oh, but no, B5's hanging. Oh no. Ooh. King D1, Knight takes B5. And Rook takes D2, Knight takes A3. So I think Black is getting just enough pawns here because Rook A2 is meant by Knight C4, and you can't take on A4 because Knight B2 check. So th this looks like it's been mishandled by both sides. and. Lately, by Anna Sergisian, b5, she'll play king c3. And then if I'm black, I go king f4, king g4. Go over and take that last white pawn and say, I'm, there's no way I can lose this position. So I think finally, when this position is done here, it's going, it's going to be a draw. Don't take on b5 yet, otherwise knight c3. Yeah, check. there's so many forks. So I'm just worried that Anna will step into a fork. Of course, I'm rooting for the underdog, especially if her name is Anna. <laughs> so uh, I'm really getting on well with Badur Jabalov, and he's a great player, but in this game, I thought that Anna Sergisian deserves at least half a point for the fighting spirit and just a very brilliant game all in all. Yep, and here we see um, the game. We know it's going to be a draw because Rook against Knight is a theoretical draw and a quite easy theoretical draw. So um, even though she's going to win this A pawn and go up a Rook versus Knight, that is an easy draw to make. So this was a fantastic game, a draw by agreement. Anna wow. Sargisian should be very proud of her. that move F6. But it's all she saved this game because she made that move F6 way back when that I'll show quickly. Just yeah. here, this move pawn to F6 and move 31, opening up diagonal for the queen, the F-file for the rooks, and that was a really amazing move that allowed her to not just go down very quickly. So impressive game here by Anna Sargisson. Yes, she mishandled her advantage, but still, once she got worse to have the resolve to play a move like F6, which is not an easy move to play, I am very impressed by how she managed to survive this game. I am impressed by Anna as well, and, and this is even like this, that she didn't manage to win it, still a great result. The problem for the Eagles is that they lost now the first round because of their board won, Zevan Andresian going down against Nika Volkov. But don't worry guys, those of you who are fans of the Eagles, three more rounds are left. I was going to show that I have a muck here, not that I can root for any teams, but they are the ones who have given us souvenirs. So if the Tbilisi gentleman want me to drink from 
a gentleman mug, <laughs> I need them to send me one. For now, I only have the Armenia Eagles is the best mug with my face on it. Yeah, they did bribe us. No, I'm just kidding. They just were very, they were very <laughs> gracious. They came to the Protest League semis and won the whole thing last year. And their manager, Artak Minukian, provided us with some swag, right? Some, some nice swag. And actually, I have a quote from Artak Minukian. Uh, How do you prepare for Protest League matches? And he said that we share what schemes are better and find the opponent's weak points before the match. So this team is oh. very tight knit. They play together. They're all friendly. Um, they actually use a pretty much entirely local squad. So mm -hmm. they um, are part of this Tigran Petrosian chess house. And Chess Mood is a site that just was released. So it's very nice to see the camaraderie from the Armenian Eagles. Yes, I'm usually really loving the team spirit in Armenian teams in general at the Chess Olympiads too. I feel like one of the closest, friendliest team is the team of Armenia. They not just fight at the board, at the chess board, but they also go for team walks and they always have dinner together. So it feels like there's something about the Armenian people and team competitions that brings them even closer. That's, at least that's my impression. It's the lavash. It's definitely lava. <laughs> Must be the reason. Yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> Must be the reason. <laughs> it's the pomegranate and the lava, definitely. Uh, but yeah, Armenia, I, I had a really fantastic time there. I spent several days after the Olympiad with Tatev Abrahamian, who plays for the United States women's team, one of the strongest players uh, in the country. And she is uh, grew up in Yerevan. So it was really nice to visit and just a very great culture indeed. And huge respect for chess, thanks to the mm -hmm. likes of Tigran. Petrosian, the former world champion. Indeed. And Mr. Nubershak uh, with the black pieces, I see that's the game that you've brought up. Shall we check in with the underwater hotel designer? Yeah, the that's Mohammed uh, Sheikh here with the black pieces. And I, well, I'm trying to figure out if white is going to be okay here or if black's better. Because at some point, white's going to try to attack this king with a move like b5. And if you take on b5, then I go bishop takes b5, and all of a sudden your knight in d7 is pinned and feeling quite vulnerable. But if b5, bishop b5, check. I guess the king is in an awkward spot for white, huh? If I go to c2, then I can't, excuse me, to c4, I can't go to c2. If I go to c4, then you can take on b5, and I have to take with the king, which is not what I wanted. Mm -hmm. If I go to b3, then rook b2, check, and actually I'm getting close to getting checkmated over here. But perhaps actually king b3, rook b2, check, king a4, and the king is safer than it initially appeared on the a4 square. Yes, I'm really trying to evaluate this position, but all I would say about it is that it's complex. I think it's more dangerous for white because of the open king position, and there's a knight on the board, a dangerous beast. They are down to one minute, both players, so blunders can happen. On a blunders can happen, but they will happen. That's my feeling about this game. <laughs> because it's, no, it's like both kings are feeling unsafe here. And so you get, you just that psychological aspect of, all right, I need to protect my king at all costs. So uh, I make a defensive move that might not be the best and things like that can really backfire. And well, b6 check is scaring me right now because that's a big threat for white followed by queen e8 checkmate. So how do you defend that? Rook b2 check. The king goes to a4, and if I, after king a4, I take on b5 with my rook on b2, then bishop takes b5, and I have a pin on this knight on d7. So rook b2 check played. He spent a bit too much time on this. He had one minute, and he used half of that minute on giving a check on b2. I thought that was not very wise, and now he starts thinking again, so he should speed up. Yeah. That's all I can say to Nuvarshak. He has to speed up. Taking on b5, allowing bishop takes b5, I don't think was a good change in the position because now there's pressure on the d7 knight, which is pinned, and the f7 pawn drops. I think black is messing it up in the time trouble. Yeah, and once f7 falls, now e6 and g6 are both under attack. g5, here is the move I'd play. 15 seconds left, and the position has worsened for black, so now it is white who can collect even more pawns. The e6 pawn is also not yet. in the air. If he takes on d7 first, yeah. that's not stepping to fork town. Fork town. Yep, that, that would be a big problem. I know we have an emote for the forks, so um, yeah. yeah, you don't want to walk into that. So took on d7 first, queen e6. No, no fork anymore. And now the question for white is, can I get king b5 and pawn c6 in quite quickly and try to rush my a pawn on the board? So I do like this move, rook to d2. Putting your rook on a dark square where it can be protected by a bishop seems wise. And, okay, queen b6, king to... 
But now C6 looks pretty dangerous, actually. I'm just curious in the meantime, if Greg could give us some information on what is Badur Javava doing at the moment, because he has used two minutes of the clock and no first move has been played on the board. So I'm curious if he's still dancing, is he at the board, AKA at the computer, or what's going on with Mr. Javava? No idea. I never know what's going on with Mr. Javava. Uh, his <laughs> chess is both brilliant and puzzling, but his dance moves I've heard are, are quite interesting, so. <laughs> um, you know, he's always dancing on the stream, it sounds like. He was at the computer. Ah, oh, he has just gotten back. He may have taken a quick bathroom break and lost two minutes. That is very uh, plausible and has happened many times in the Pro Chess League. And, well, Kriavkin right now with the white pieces, Anna, I mean, the A-pawn has moved very quickly here. And, okay, I, the one thing I will note is if that black king can run to the king side and I can sacrifice my bishop for that pawn on the A-file, I probably have a... F oh, he's stepping to mate one! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, my <laughs> God! Oh, no! I don't know. That's, that's so bad. That's, it happened so quick. That's so... I didn't even realize. I didn't realize either. The king went to c5 and queen c4. What a configuration of pieces. The geometry is unreal here. That is so bad. Oh, I feel terrible because... You know, he's the underwater hotel guy, and I thought he, he would try to go king d7, king e6, king f7, and put his rook on f6 and try to sacrifice his bishop for the pawn and try to claim a fortress. I know Magnus Carlsen said he doesn't believe in fortresses, but perhaps some position like that I mean, is looking close to a fortress for black because just to throw some moves on the board, let's say I give a check, and I go a6, and then I go king f6, and a7, I take it, something like this. Well, I mean, it might be hard for white to make progress if I put my rook on the f5 square and something like that. I don't know. I'm not positive that it is a fortress, but at least it gives black a good chance to hold a position like this. Instead, wow, I can't believe that. King c5 and after king, the queen c4 checkmate on the board. Yikes. Yeah, we totally missed the moment and also Greg has written in the chat, Lord Robert giving some long technical line and the guy just gets mated. Well, we, <laughs> Robert was being very instructive, but yes, Mohamed stepped into mating one as severian said he's got to be shaking now oh that's a good one no pun intended right <laughs> <laughs> ouch that that hurts that really hurts it's really painful though like uh, we are making fun of the players but it's very painful to lose a game like this Black had no problems. Maybe he was even better when he still had his f7 pawn on the board. He gave a check on b2 and then took on b5. That, that was somehow not in line with what Black should have done. Nope. Yeah, that, that hurts. I mean, honestly, it was a very interesting game, and Mohamed Sheikh is a good player, but you know, sometimes you just totally forget about mate and ones. It sounds very basic, yeah. but you're just yes. not looking for checkmate. Like, where was the checkmate before this? It was not even close to mm. happening, and so you walk right into it. Good for Kriavkin to... Uh, pick up that full point. So where to next now that this game is over? We we haven't really checked out the Estonia horses against the Volga Stormbringers, so at some point we should definitely play, pay closer attention to that match. Uh, but, okay, they're still only in the second round of action, so we still plenty of time left to call our attention there. I'm looking at some of the games within the Dynamites and the Wizards because most of those games are entering the Blitz phase, a.k.a. Blunder phase yep. and Time Trouble. Okay, so I pulled up Tanya right. Sashev's game. I can't game. tell yet which one is the most exciting. Oh, Boris Stavchenko, top board of the wizard is a piece down. Okay, let me find that. What is... It is a piece down. I don't even see what composition he has for it. Zero? Yeah, playing Rishi Sardana here. Black is up a piece for one pawn? Just one? Yeah, just one pawn. Yeah. Yeah, Anna, I'm, I'm with you here. This looks... I wonder where the piece was captured. I'm just going to go back very quickly to see if it was a blunder. Oh, it it was a very exciting game, actually, where Black Black sacrificed. What did he do? Oh, my. It was Whoa. Yeah, I'm, I'm... It was a rook for two pieces, but then it for a moment it was an exchange down and almost a rook down. Yeah, he went for it. Do you see the position at move 26? Yeah. Where Black has these two amazingly strong pass pawns. He's in exchange down and for a moment almost a rook down. <laughs> but those pawns, the pawns can't be stopped. Yeah, those pawns kept 
running, 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 and then <laughs> we're not stopping. And it looks like Rishi Sardana will pick up this full point unless something goes wrong for him at this this moment. But no, he's up a uh, piece for just one pawn. He should be able to win this quite easily. And he brought his king forward, and now this king can go d6, c6, and over to b5 uh, at the very worst. Yeah, it's going to be a win for Rishi Sardana. What a game against the top board of the Russian team, Boris Savchenko. This is the day of the upsets, and not just any upsets. So we have seen board one players, including Zevan Andresian, Badur Jabava, and now Boris Savchenko suffering against lower rated players. Yep. No, it's pretty great to see. And that's part of what's great about the pro chessing in general, is you see these board fours and board threes getting play against these board ones and board twos for other teams. And so you see a huge difference in ratings, but some very capable chess players who are just looking for the opportunity. They're hungry for the opportunity to upset these very strong uh, opponents that they face. Mentioning hungry, uh, Mr. Hess, yep. do you know that you owe me, you owe me a box of chocolate? Um, you know, my memory is pretty bad, so I don't know why you think I owe you <laughs> Can that. Can the chat remind you that you owe me a box of chocolate? I think even Mubot used to know about that. Yeah. Mubot is very smart. I, I, I'm aware. I owe you chocolate. Anish reminded <laughs> me. He said he did it for you. So, Anish Giri, it's uh, your fault. Curse you, Anish. No, I'm just kidding. Anish is a great guy. Anish, thank you so much. It was a family effort. I thanked him. <laughs> I thanked him publicly for the family effort. Uh, now you're reminding me and it hurts again. Just. Uh... But I, I still have one or two pieces left from the Belgian chocolate that Robert got me from Bruges. So I'm keeping it like a treasure. Like I don't want to finish the box. So I'm, I'm not eating the last pieces on purpose, Aww. which is very difficult for me. Believe me, guys. <laughs> I am impressed. Uh, definitely <laughs> impressed because I know how much you love chocolate. So uh, good on you for you know, savoring it as long as possible, but... Yeah, I, I can only do it because I have like 10 other boxes of chocolate <laughs> next to me. Otherwise, it would not survive, that's for sure. Yeah, no, I trust me, if I had a box of uh, Belgian chocolates near me, they would not survive either. But, um, <laughs> all right, so, oh, Tanya has three seconds, two seconds, she's no connection. Oh. She just got her connection what? back and she lost on time. No. Oh, no. Oh, no, she lost. She, she lost due to misconnection, disconnection. Yes, in a position where it looks like she's holding on here. Maybe she's slightly Ooh. worse with the black pieces, but she lost on time. I tuned in right at the last second there to see her lose the game on time. That is so sad. This is uh, Tanya's second defeat, but in a very sad way, disconnection in internet chess. Unfortunately, it, it can happen. And there's nothing that one can do about it. We have also just seen that Hikaru had to stop his eight-hour stream way earlier than planned because of an electricity outage. So unfortunately, these things happen. Yeah, I said misconnection, but I meant disconnection. I miss strategy, and I do mispronounce things <laughs> sometimes. That's, that was very clever. Yeah, no, I mean, that's just heartbreaking, honestly, for Tanya because her position was defensible there and unfortunately she had no connection so she had no opportunity to try to fight on and I went back to the Sevchenko game but okay black is now up a bishop and one pawn and that pawn on f6 is yes it's protected by pawn on g5 but it's only a matter of time before black plays bishop f2 bishop h4 and starts gobbling up pawns so for the, the Dynamites, that game is brilliant, but Tanya's loss is making the match a tight match still, as far as I can see. Oh, well, the four points already for the Wizards. I was not calculating with one victory. Yep. And I see this Abhijit Gupta game where he's up a piece with the white pieces against Andrei Skvortsov, but it's not the easiest position just because the pawns on B3, except now that I look at it, that pawn is probably going to be, oh, well, the bishop on d one's hanging, hmm. and it's pinned. So is white going to play knight b2 here? A, a passive move for just one more move, and then try to protect the bishop, win the b3 pawn, and push the a pawn all at once? Yeah, good question. In this moment, well, I'm just wondering about that b3 pawn. Yes, how can white take it? Yeah, the pin. And when? When is the moment to take it? Is, 
Yeah, because the knight on c4 and the bishop on d1 are both hanging, right, by this rook on d4. So knight b2 defends both and then allows this white rook on b8 to take on b3 next, and that seems to be perhaps holding on. But the problem with knight b2 is you go king g7, and now bishop d6 check is a really, really, really annoying threat. So Abijah decides to give up the bishop on d1 so that he can eliminate the passed pawn. Oh, now if rook... rook takes d1, okay, black chooses to take the knight instead. But this is winning, because rook g3 check, yeah. he loses bishop, you lose the f7 pawn Ooh. with check, and you know you take this bishop on f8, take on f7, you're up two pawns now, and perhaps there's some sort of, oh, rook f to g8 or something like that, rook f g7. Just don't repeat three times, Abijah, don't. Do it. No, he's trying to go rook g8 check, rook g7 mate. Oh, it's mate. Mate. Yeah, we caught it. We caught mate on the board, almost. Ye if black had not resigned. Yeah, that is a nice finish there for Abhijagupta. Instead of keeping the complications alive, he simplified into a much better uh, position there. Very instructive that instead of trying to keep the piece up, he went for the simplification in the right moment. So this is one more point for the dynamite. That's going to be four to three. And Savchenko going down, the dynamites can tie the score in this second round of the match, four four. Yeah, and the dynamite were in fifth place as I pull the standings up really quickly. Fifth place behind the Mumbai Movers uh, for fourth. And if, remember, the top four teams make the playoffs. They're still this week. There's still another head-to-head -head week, and then there's the Battle Royale, another one where you can really gain many points. But they have to do work quickly. There's not that much time to play catch-up in the remainder of the season. Indeed. Today and next week will be the last regular matches before the last Battle Royale, and it's over 10 weeks of the first stage of the Pro Chess League. Every division will have four players qualifying to the playoff stage, that's going to be a knockout. But it's also about the last places because the, the bottom two teams, unfortunately, will need to say goodbye to the Pro Chess League next season unless they qualify again from the qualification tournament. Yep. So you, know, you don't want to be relegated, that's for sure. If you're the Armenian Eagles, well, you want to get that one seed. You're already in, clearly going to make the playoffs. So you just want to claim that top spot to get the draw odds that you talked about before. And, well, okay, they're in an interesting tight matchup with the gentleman uh, as the highlight of the day. That's definitely the match that we're going to keep our eyes on the most because it's for first the standings. But I did say we want to keep an eye on the horses a little bit better versus the Volga Stormbringers. So do we have any interesting games from that matchup? I know Jan Elvis is playing. I believe Tuan Berg is playing. So I'm happy to go wherever you lead me. Uh I just quickly wanted to check uh, Savchenko's game. I know we have covered this, but we thought that Black was winning with a piece up, and now he's in exchange down. What? Where's his rook? What? Why? No. Why? Where is his rook? He won h6 and blundered after g6. Oh no! I moved six. Uh, move 69. Yeah, he blundered rook e8 check followed by g7, which oh, forced no. him. Oh, blunders happen, especially in speed chess. But okay, at least Black is not losing the game. So you, you might have blundered, but you can never lose. You have a bishop against a rook. But this is a sad, sad moment for Rishi Sardana for the Delhi Dynamite. And this was a game they needed to tie the match score. Don't lose on time. Oh, barely got that move off. Wow, that, you know, all of a sudden I'm looking at the clock at three seconds, two seconds. I don't know what he's thinking because <laughs> scaring me over here. Yeah, he made flag. He had a, a piece up, just a full piece up. Now he's about to lose on time. So he's doing everything he can to not win the game. We see that, but please don't. Yeah, please don't. seriously. Like, <laughs> just control it. Um, Eight seconds left for black. This is a draw position. And... Finally, it's a repetition. Draw by agreement, but it could ha it was going to be three for repetition anyway. What an escape by Boris Savchenko from a completely lost position. And Rishi Sardana must be totally upset. Yeah, you have to be. A completely easily winning position. And then, of course, he fumbled that advantage away. Whew, not good. Not good. But um, oh. Not good at all. You wanted to see the Estonia horses. I'm going to check in with their games and see which one is the most exciting. Okay. 
Let's check it out. So I see, I'll bring up just the Elvis game for the time being until we find this position. Looks nice for Jan Elvis. The C7 pawn is hanging. Uh, the rook on c1 is well placed. Okay, b2 is also similarly under attack, but if you ever take b2 with your bishop, I can always go rook b1 and win your b7 pawn. So it uh, looks very nice here for Jan. He played e4, just trading into an endgame that's much, much better for him over Vasily Korchmar. A game that is not looking so nice for the horses is their board for Minarva. I think she's in trouble right now after bishop to d7. There are pins everywhere, so a knight has just been captured on d7. It's already a piece up for white, and the rook on f7 is pinned. The e7 bishop is hanging. I think she is probably considering to just resign. Yeah, pawn takes e7 here works because normally you'd be able to take on f1, but there's a pin here. Now white has two minor pieces, two bishops, two great bishops for rook, and well, f7 is falling next because e8 equals queen, he takes f8, so resignation occurred. My Narva, unfortunately, goes down for the Estonia horses, and that's a nice win for the Volga Stormbringers. They're trying to fight back. I know Grigory or Parin must be very happy as their top board, very strong player, and um, yeah, we'll see. I bring up the game between Mikhail Bryakin and Antonios Pavlidis, the Greek grandmaster here with the white pieces. He has a position where he's up a pawn and Black's king looks unsafe. So I really like his chances to beat Mikhail Bryakin of the Stormbringers. Yeah, and of course, uh, this match is, is really important. The horses are at the, the seventh place at the moment. They badly need a win if they want to keep their position in the Proches League for the next season. And the same goes for the Moscow Phoenix. At the moment, they are the very last in the Eastern Division. They forgot to play one of the matches, which is really sad that they didn't realize that in the Battle Royale, their match was on Tuesday and not the usual Thursday as the regular season. So they basically got zero point for not fighting at all. They didn't realize that the match was on Tuesday. Uh, bad luck, but it happens and every manager and every team is in charge of the schedule. They cannot be notified 10 times in email just so that they turn up at the board. No, you're absolutely correct. And you have to be on top of these things. You know, imagine in sport, right? If uh a basketball team just didn't show up because they yeah. forgot they had a game that day. And it, I'm not trying to blame anyone in particular. I'm just saying, you know, it's an no, unfortunate situation and one that uh, you always have to remember that schedule may change just because you play on Thursday in one week doesn't mean that you're always going to play on Thursday. So it's always good to check the schedule as many times as possible. So, okay, Antonio Pavlidis here is going to cruise to victory. I feel pretty confident in saying that against... Uh, Mikhail Bryakin because, well, what do you even do as black here? You can play queen f5, but I can even consider taking on f5, trading into an endgame that looks favorable, but I'd probably just move my queen away and continue the attack. Why should I trade queens when your king is on f7 and is in the wide open and white is up a pawn? So I, I think that Bryakin would be happy to trade queens, all things considered. And if I'm Pavlidis, keep the queens on the board, keep pressuring your opponent, you're up four and a half minutes. You're up a pawn. You have a safer king. Black has no counterplay. Keep those queens on and go for victory. Yeah, this is a very difficult position to hold. And I'm on the same page with you. White will keep the queen on the board. With When you see that the opponent's king is weaker than yours, it's usually a good idea not to consider trading queens at all, ever, like ever. <laughs> keep the queens on the board because that's the best attacking piece. You need it. Absolutely, 100%. Um, so, what other games do we have going on here? I see Anna Sargisian is playing. That game looks very interesting. So, I know I, I was the one who was saying, let's say, in the Estonia matchup. But this game, this matchup is for first place in the division. And right now, Sargisian is up two pawns? Is she just... Well, she's up two pawns, right? Uh, let me find the game of Anna Sergesian. She played extremely well against Badur Javava in the first round, and now she is once again having a better position. Yeah, I think she's two pawns. Is that? Yeah. Wow. And the last move was bishop takes h4. I'm going to go back to move 10 just to see what happened here. So sure. I'm just going to scroll through the moves pretty quickly and see how white got himself in such a tough position. I mean, structurally, that bishop on e4 is great, but if white is able to kick that bishop out of e4 and play f5 
you know, at some point you can make huge progress. But she played g6, she went knight g7, e6 was played, sacrificing one pawn. So I'm looking at that very skeptically. Went knight g5 and then took this bishop on e4. So that was weird decision making by Pansulaya to give up one pawn and then lose another. And now go ahead and win this pawn on b7. Black is just going to ca uh, castle, or maybe not castle and play for h4. But I think you just castle here, and then you're threatening rook b8. The bishop on e3 is hanging. I mean, this looks very, very nice for Anna Sargassian. Yeah, I'm puzzled by this e6 push. It feels a bit like uh, Pantolaya was over optimistic about his attacking chances. And now Anna Sargassian being a, a very healthy pawn up. White is capturing the b7 and a7 pawns, but the problems don't stop. If knight f5, h4, it is the white king that will be under attack. Yeah, I really like your move knight f5 here because white has just restored material equality. Okay, I think black can even take on b2 if you want to continue being up some material, but knight f5, just logical play. Don't care about the number of pawns, care about whose pieces are better, who's more active, whose king is safer. Knight f5 played by Anna Sargassian. So Anna, are you... Anna Rudolph Sargassian right now because it seems like you two are on a, a very similar and strong wavelength here. I'm just channeling the mood or she's channeling me her thoughts probably that's that's the way it goes because she's an active player I'm not so she's making the strongest moves against some of the top grandmasters of Georgia. They are basically the Olympic team of Georgia Tib the Tbilisi gentleman and Anna Sargassian is single-handedly taking them down basically. Yeah she made a draw against um uh, I was going to call him Lexi Sexy against Badur Jabawa. Lexi Sexy is his handle on chess.com. And now she is taking down Levon Pansulai. But we've seen her have good positions. We've seen many players have good positions and not be able to finish their opponent off. So we have to make sure if you're Anna Sargissian, you say, okay, we both have four minutes. We're going to enter that real time trouble phase soon. I just need to make sure I play with confidence play quickly, and I really don't see how white gets out of this because the bishop on a7 is stuck there as rook to b8 will be a threat if you move it, and after rook b8 comes, b2 is going to be hanging. If you move the bishop anyway, a2 is hanging. So uh, it just feels so uncomfortable to have this position for Levon Pansulaya. Yeah, I think he's in trouble, but we have said this already in the case of Badur Jawawa. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I want to see Anna Sargisian finishing this game winning the game, converting her advantage into a full point, but it's not so easy to take 2,600 Grandmasters down just because the position is advantageous for Black. Yeah, no, he just he's thinking here. So his position is bad. He's spending time. It's, okay, played Rook C1, and now the question is for Black, do you play, wait a second, H4 looks good. Knight D6. I'm loving H4, yeah. Knight D6 also looks good. Kicking this queen. Where's the queen go? How do you protect that bishop on A7? Ooh, true, because Knight D6, the queen has to be protecting the A7 bishop. That is queen to C7, but then Knight B5. Or if queen B6, Knight to C8. Yep, and the knight is a funny little piece here, just going around trying to win this bishop. And actually, Knight D6 looks really good. H4, can't complain about that move, of course. You mentioned it earlier. I'm just repeating it, h4 just to open up the white king even more. Both moves looking good. Pantolaya is in deep trouble. Now we gotta see if Sargisian will play those moves quickly because she has to speed up too. It's three minutes for both players, but this could be a big upset. Their board, war board one, Zavan Andresian, the Eagles top board, he went down against board four, the gentleman in the first round. So this is a very, exciting match with the underdogs performing well. She goes for rook f to c8 to protect the c6 pawn. Maybe it was not necessary. She could have gone for something more aggressive, knight d6 or h4, but still the position is looking great for black. Yeah, I mean, she's just taking her time here, but sometimes it's a problem where you get a bit defensive, saying, I don't even want to give my opponent any counterplay, but then mm -hmm. when you get too passive, you allow your opponent to coordinate well and hold. But here, her position looks so nice that I'm not even seeing opportunities for white to improve the position. As we keep talking about, you ever move this bishop from a7, then a rook comes to b8, and then you lose the b2 pawn. Or a rook takes a2 will be in the cards as well. So I guess rook takes a2 is a blunder now because bishop takes d5. Nice tactical shot. 
because mm -hmm. the pawn on c6 is pinned as the rook on c8 is hanging behind it. If the queen takes on d5, you lose this rook on c8 anyway. So just be careful in a position like this. This is a moment where you don't take that pawn a2 because that's a... Don't be a pawn grabber for once. Yeah, you're not... <laughs> don't do that. You're not playing do for that. the Pittsburgh pawn grabbers. <laughs> no. I just love getting extra material for free, but no, this is not the right moment. And I agree with Icelandic Gambit. He's saying in the chat, every time I manage to catch the Eastern Division, it seems like Sargisian is crushing some GM. It has been the case many times. She has performed extremely well for her team, the Eagles. But we shall see if she manages to finish this game in style and collect the full point. Yep. Um... Yeah. But the B2 pawn was also free, so it's better that she took that one. Yep. So she took free stuff. Free stuff is nice. If this, you know, next move can be bishop d4, and then black will continue to take over all of the dark squares. Bishop to d4. Now both players are down to two minutes, two and a half minutes for Anna Sergisian. Bishop d4 is a nice move getting trade, uh, trading the pair of bishops off white and also getting the d4 square that's the square i was going to highlight once the knight jumps to d4 this is almost game over yeah i mean just things are went from bad to worse for Pansulai in this game that's for sure and a very nice game by anna sargis and she's trying to make a case to be mvp of the week right every single week we see players nominated for mvp but if you can score yeah. one and a half of the two against the gentleman's top two boards you're certainly in the running for that yeah, it was almost two out of two. She had a very nice position against Badur Jababa. Mentioning Badur Jababa, how is he doing now? Lexi Sexy. Ooh, that is... That is an end game where Jababa is a pawn up, but... No, no, it's not a pawn up. I can't count. I didn't see, I didn't see the A4 pawn. It's okay, I can't count either. Yeah, there's still a pawn on A4 there, but that... There is a pawn, but... This, I was going to say, even if it was a pawn up, maybe it wasn't enough material, but the a3 knight is out of the game. So that's the only problem of black, that the a3 knight is basically trapped. Yeah. Um, hold up. Sorry, just had to do something there. And yeah, the knight a3 is now, trapped. Now, black can give a check on the c file, and then the knight comes out of a3. So I think this should be okay. Rook c6 check, and then knight c4, knight c2. Yeah, the rook c6 is nice because the king can't. If the king can go to b3, then your knight's still stuck. But the king cannot go to b3 because Anna, that pawn on a4 still exists. Yeah, it does exist. <laughs> At the moment, it's still there. No, I guess knight c4. We are, knight c2. Sorry, knight c4 in case of king d2 and knight c2 in case of king d4. The knight has to come out of the a3 square in time. What's, is he trying to go for some hopeful checkmate? You know, like if I can get my bishop to e4 next, the king... Actually, I see that as like a joke, like, oh, there's no way checkmate can happen. But if you play a3 and I play bishop e4, you need to keep defending your knight on c2, so your rook has to go somewhere in the c mm. file. And then my king goes to f6, and it's getting closer and closer to a potential checkmate construction. Yeah, black still has to be careful here. And we know Jabawa, how good he is in tactics. So if there's a slight tactical chance, he's going to take it. He's going to take it. Yep. Yeah, wow. So, and Gabrillion is 26 seconds. No, I think Jabawa is going to win this game. You cannot... No time for black and the position is still dangerous. Only a few pieces left on the board. So you might think this is boring, but no. Like they're mating nets if the black king is, is stuck on the back rank. 13 seconds left. So, rook c3. Okay, so king f6 threatens mate, but then rook c6 will check will kick my king out. So I would start with a move like bishop to e4, perhaps. And you do not want to face a bishop and rook versus king endgame. So rook takes g3 should theoretically still be close to drawish territory, but don't do that in an endgame like this. And rook e3 is possible here. I think Six seconds, five, four. Oh boy, four. here comes king f6. Here comes king f6. Watch out. I, I mean, King has six, no check on c6, no check on f3, and back rank problems. There are. That's it. Oh, I kind of, I like that move. It was unexpected. So now King f6. Here it goes. King e8 yeah. is going to be three seconds left. He's going to fly. Woo. Play, play g5 oh. or bishop f5. Here comes the g pawn. I, He's getting mated or flagging like one of the options. It's going to happen. Rook a8 check. 
King d7, bishop f5 check, and then push that g pawn home to get a queen. I think actually already white is winning. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if white's already won. I think the position should be winning already, yes, because the g pawn is very advanced and the knight is not getting back to capture it. If the knight could be sacrificed for the g pawn, that would be a drawn position. But black is not in time, black is not in time, ne neither on the clock nor on the board with this knight being too far from the king's side. Yeah, I mean, that shows the big problem with knights, right? The bishop can go long bishop range. The g6 check I'm not that sure of because it's blocking another way of the g pawn. Okay, so bishop f7, rook f4 check, makes sense. King e6, I think, because king, no, king e5 is also possible. But okay, king e6 to keep that bishop protected. Well, um, oh, he oh, barely got that off in time. He played with zero, zero, 004 seconds left on the clock, and now he's flagging. Oh, no. Huge win for Jabao, and he, he earned it. He earned it. He earned it. And the position must be winning already. So it's not just the time situation, but time pressure certainly helps in difficult positions. Yeah, wow. I mean, just... Ooh. Whew, just just G-Pawn rolling through to become a queen. And of course, there were so many checkmating nets. And it's funny, Anna, at first, you forgot there was a pawn. I was like, oh, well, it's, now that I see there's a pawn, it looks like, well, almost yeah. even... Okay, there are some games of nine seconds left. So I'm going over to Ranak Sedwani versus... Zaur to Kiev because to Kiev has 10 seconds left, but also this game between Volkov and actually let's go to that game I'm sorry. There's too many games in time trouble here. Yeah, I know and Anna Sergisian Let's just highlight that in the meantime. She has won her game against Levan Pantsulaya So Anna Sergisian rated at 23 31. She's taking down a 2600 Grandmaster that is Pantsulaya It's made on the board if you just want to show later the the final position of Anna Sergisian. It's beautiful Okay, and we just saw a draw between some Velter Sahak and Nika Volkov. Volkov goes one and a half out of two at the top two boards as well. And Anna Sergisian, you checkmate on this board. I don't even know what sound I just made, but it seems to be a proper response to seeing this kind of checkmate here, where black is up an entire rook and white's king was mated on the board. So a nice win for Anna Sargissian, a nice one and a half out of two for Nika Volkov. But this is a great matchup between these two powerhouses in the Eastern Division. Yeah, Pantelaya being a gentleman, allowing mate, I think he was definitely aware of the mate coming. He just played it out till the final position. I think that that shows class. So lose with dignity. And in this case, he allowed mate because it's a beautiful position. Wow, look at her move. Rook h8 on move 37. That was phenomenal. Threatening knight g4 check. And if the bishop takes the g4, oh. h takes g with a mate down the h file. That was a really nice play by her. And after f6, she took it, went for knight g4. Okay, that king went up, but it got mated anyway. So Anna Sargissian playing excellent chess here for the Armenia Eagles. And it's a cl yeah, close Yeah, very matchup. classy move, Rook AJ. I think that has been one of the best attacking moves in the game, threatening knight g4 beautifully played so one and a half points for Anna Sargisian after the first two games playing two of the top grandmasters from Georgia yeah no she is just in excellent form today and it's great to see if you're an Armenian Eagles fan the score so far is still a point lead for the gentlemen is there still a game going on I was looking for the same, but I... Oh, no, the, sorry, now I see that it's all added up. So they have finished the second round to one point. One point advantage for the gentleman, but a very tight match. Yep, N and not so tight, at least right now, is the Moscow Phoenix versus the Mumbai Movers. But I have Raunek Sadwani's game up. He's about to win, as long as he doesn't blunder a checkmate. Um, he can always throw a rookie seven check in, play pawn to b6, and that's what he's about to do. And he's about to get a queen. So Raunek Sadwani winning for the Mumbai Movers. That will bring it six to four. So they're trying to close the gap in this matchup. He played very quickly and seemingly very well, and he got that victory. So congratulations to the youngster who just got his first GM norm in recent days, not even recent weeks. And I see the game between um, Abhimanyu Puranik, that's Savelli, Savelli Tartikover, versus mm -hmm. uh, Abhidabi here. That's Dmitry Kriyavkin. And what is going on here? This black king has to move over to F8, I think, and he's losing that rook on d yeah then the rook is captured so <laughs> that is the only move unless bishop d7 but then bishop takes and there's a pin on the back rank so black cannot take on d7 he would need to play king to e7 Ugh. doesn't look good 
No, at least it keeps the game going, but the H2 mate is it still in the air, right? So if white takes on D8 with check, black plays king to G7, and you can't move your queen away because queen H2 is mate, but you are in time for the move pawn to G3, which stops the mate on H2 and attacks the queen on F4. So that is why white is able to get away with this. And so queen takes D8 check, king is all gonna be forced, king G7, G3, no checkmate on h2, hitting your queen on f4. So feel free to do a queen trade when you're down in exchange. Mm. White should be winning here. Yeah. This, this is going to be a win for the Phoenix. And that's getting close to the eight and a half points they need for team victory. The Moscow Phoenix is currently the at the very bottom of the standings in the Eastern Division. That's also mainly due to the fact that they skipped the Battle Royale where you can collect the highest number of points and they simply didn't realize that they had to play on Tuesday and not on Thursday. So they missed to play and at the moment they are trailing behind their horses with one point. Now, as you know, it's all about the playoffs, but two, uh, it matters if you can keep your place in the Proces League and the top, the top four qualify for the playoffs, but the bottom two will be relegated from the Proces League. Yep. Yep, everything you said is 100% true. Um, so, yeah, this is going to be interesting. Oh, wait, Kriopkin lost his connection. What? Another player losing his connection for the Moscow Phoenix. What's going on he with the weather forecast and what's happening in terms of, like, storms and thunder? Uh, Hikaru also lost power in his apartment. Tanya Sajdev lost due to disconnection and that Kriopkin is disconnecting and he has only 18 seconds left to come back to the live chess zone here on chess.com <gasps> okay he got a move he in. made it he made it he got back but if any one more disconnection and he's gonna lose on time so he needs to um stay he needs to stabilize the internet connection call up your service provider i don't know do whatever you can what's the temperature like in moscow is it snowing out there I'm gonna figure it out. And how is the weather? How comes that they are losing their internet connections? Well, I see the weather is two degrees and it says cloudy. Well, I don't know, maybe some snow as well. It's hard to see. Hmm. But yikes. Not good. Don't want to lose on time in a winning position. No, definitely not. He's going for the trade of Queens now with the exchange up. Logical decision. Yeah, exchange and how many pawns up? Three pawns? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's just a completely winning position. But nine seconds left, and if he once again disconnects, he will not have enough time to come back. Yeah, and I actually just put my eye over there on the Ahmed Adli game. We'll keep, we'll keep, okay, six, five, four, four, three, two, two. one. He's no. fighting, he's oh. fighting in a winning oh. uh, One second. Why is he doing this to our heart and our health? He's got a completely winning position. There are like 10 moves that win, and he almost flagged. Yeah, this is two, one. Oh, he's, okay. His connection <sighs> seems to be back for now. Ooh. I mean, you know what I would do, honestly, if I'm uh, Puranic here? I would wait until I see the bar. You see this bar that says how the connection is? Yeah. I would wait until I see that it's very low and then make my Oh move. my, that's so tricky. Right. The, that is so... One second! Woo! He lost on time. He flagged! He flagged! He lost on time. To In a completely winning position. Whether it was the internet connection, the mouse, or both. This is very sad news for the Phoenix. Losing on time in a winning position feels bad, man. Yep. And Bug Kitten goes, uh, Hess is such a schemer. I mean, look, if it's a team event and connection is part of the story here, I'm waiting until I see that bar go as low as possible and then I'm making my move, right? I just know that my opponent's bad connection, obviously. And so I need to maximize my chances. And okay, honestly, as a chess player, as a GM, I hate winning games like this, but it's a team competition. It's part of um, the atmosphere, it's part of what happens, and so it's nobody's fault except for, well, Kriavkin and maybe the service service provider. I would be on an angry phone call right now if I'm Kriavkin. Yeah, totally, but he has to play two more rounds, so he's, he's got to make sure that his internet will be good for the next games. Asuka is saying that that was a 10 out of 10 connection analysis by Grandmaster Robert Hess. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just... Uh... 
I don't know. I guess I've dirty flagged people from time to time. <laughs> but okay, that ends the third round of action between Moscow and Mumbai. Moscow Wizards are also crushing their Indian opponent, but Mumbai got fortunate there to close the gap, and maybe they'll be able to uh, have a full comeback if the connection for the Phoenix continues to be such a problem. Yeah, but I'm, I'm really surprised that uh, we are witnessing connection problems both in the Russian team, that is in this case the Moscow Phoenix, but also uh, the Delhi Dynamite, Stanya Sashtev, lost in the second round due to disconnection. So there's something going on with, with the weather in Russia as well as in parts of India. Yeah, it's a shame. But um, okay, still lots of great chess underway here. I see that Rishi Sardana at the white piece against Andre Skvortsov, and the position is two extra pawns for white, but it's black who looks like he's doing much better. For starters, there's a knight hanging on d2. And more to the point, if I have queen f4 on, on this game between Sardana and Skvortsov, mm -hmm. queen f4 threatens mate on h2, and the only way I see to stop it is playing g3, but then you lose your queen on f1 because my rook on g8 pins your pawn on g3 to the king on g1. So, uh, yeah, Queen of Four seems like a winning move, and it's on the board. Yeah, that's a huge that's, that's upset. That's just no move, right? G three, Bishop takes up one, and there's not a single other move that could defend the H two pawn. It's game over. Rishi Sardana, who almost produced an upset win earlier, now he's going down against the lowest rated opponent he can have under Skortsov. This is how chess is: sometimes up, sometimes down. Yep, and well, I mean, it's crazy, right? This is like. The Moscow Wizards are just dominating the Delhi Dynamite, and you don't expect your 2,076 rated board four to upset an IM with the black pieces in this kind of event. But I guess that's why you put a player like Andre Sportsov, whom I'm not familiar with, honestly, on your team, because you're like, well, this is a very capable player. May have a lowish rating, but he's going to land an upset here and an upset there, and all we need from him if our, the rest of our team is so strong, is maybe half or one point and let the top boards lead the way. Yes, and that will already mean seven and a half points for the Wizards. Eight and a half is the mark that if a team gets, then they are winning the match. So they, are on, they will only be a point away from that. Queen takes H2 now. Or is there even something stronger than that? I mean, you can, you can sacrifice on G2 first and then take on H2. Yeah. Everything seems to be winning here for Black. By the way, shout out to everyone tuning in on Twitch and Chess TV. I just see that we have hit 4,000 4, viewers tuning in to watch Pro Chess League on Thursday. This is week eight. And today, the main news is that the two top teams, the Armenia Eagles and the Tbilisi Gentlemen, are facing each other. This is the first online chess event where basically chess is being played as an esport and the playoffs. The finals of the playoffs will be played live on site. We don't know the location, but the dates are May the 4th and the 5th. You got to be there. Yeah, I'm I'm still excited to hear where the location is, but it's going to be a where great... Where on earth it's going to be? We would like to know. <laughs> but we will be there for sure. And yeah, a huge shout out to everybody in the chat. Also to our mods who are keeping this chat in excellent uh, common commenting form i was like commentating i'm like no i'm commentating their comments right i gotta <laughs> i'm i'm excellent you're not <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't saying that complimenting ourselves and not complimenting the chat <laughs> well i love how they call this robo dolph because oh because well, it doesn't sound no i don't like it don't it doesn't like it? sound good i think we've had better nicknames guys you're more creative than that okay well you know they always like alexandra always calls me robo hess because then she thinks i'm can yeah, be robotic, I know, so. I know, but Robodolf doesn't, I don't know, there's something with the, with the pronunciation of that word that doesn't just sound cool enough to me. Like, oh, I'm all about how words sound, and Robodolf doesn't sound cool. Okay, I, I, you know, I defer to you Robin here. I like more. Thank you, Chess.com, for suggesting it. So, all right, so this game is looking lights out if you just take on H2 and take on G2 in some order. Um, maybe let's try to find a forced checkmate because there probably won't exist. A queen takes h2 check. Or actually, let's start with rook takes g2 just because I feel like sacrificing. Queen takes h2 check afterwards, king f1. Queen takes g2 check. Where's your king going? You don't really have many squares, e1 or e2. Let's say you go to e2, then I throw in bishop g4 check. You have king e1, and then I go, I don't know, rook e8 or something. 
Maybe, maybe something quicker, but rookie eight looks pretty nice for black, but... Yeah, this got to be made with many different lines and so many suggestions in the chat. Thank you, guys. Uh, Root Hess, that sounds so cool, to be honest. I guess it's from Rudolf and Hess, but uh, we are not rude, are we? No. Well, I am. Rook takes g2. Look at this move. Beautiful. If bishop takes g2, queen takes h2, or he seems to want to play rook g8. I don't know. Everything is winning. Apparently, in this moment, even a rook down is okay for black. Yeah, it's what happens when you have no pieces protecting your king. So you can play a move like rook g8, rook takes g2 check, and just, well, scoop up all the remaining mater material. Actually, rook g8 might even be a better move than queen takes h2, which is saying something, right? Queen h2 looks amazing, but if you can just go <laughs> rook g8, bring that another attacker into the position, and, well, that king on g1 is in a world of hurt. So I can't look at this anymore, Anna. It's hurting my eyes. It's Poggers! Poggers for this beautiful attacking move by underscore self. Rated only 2,000, and he plays rook g8 now, not even taking on h2 with a check. Bring all your toys to the nursery. That's one of my favorite chapters from Jakob Agard's book, and it's on the board, rook g8. Yeah, this is a brutal attack. Full steam ahead down the g-file, and Rishi Sardana, it's not too early for him to resign. Of course, the team event, you don't resign pretty much ever, unless it's just you know very, very clear down a queen for nothing or something like that, but yeah, he's getting checkmated soon. Goku is pointing out how well White's heavy pieces are doing on A1, B1, and C1. Great job. Yeah, I completely agree. That's the main reason why this is problematic for White, as problematic as getting mated in a few moves. Absolutely. So What about calling Sam Roberts? Isn't it the moment? But I see he's in the chat, so he knows it already. He knows it. Sam, this is Sam moments. Let's get some hype for Sam Copeland and all the great articles he's writing about the Pro Chess League every single week. Yep, Sam is great. But Sam, I wasn't calling your name yet, okay? So just for the record, you can't nominate this for Game of the Week. It's S-A-M. <laughs> are, are you cheerleading for him now? He doesn't deserve yes. that. Yes. Uh, oh, S-A-M. Sam Copeland. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm, I'm going to get off this game and go over to the game between Zavin Andreasian and Levan Pansulaya because, well, similarly, there's an attack brewing in this game. And I think Pansulaya, who sacrificed a pawn in this one, he's the one with the upper hand as Black's king is not looking very comfortable and White has two bishops, which is great for his attacking chances. I mean, just this bishop, if you play move pawn to f5, trying to close my bishop off this e4 h7 diagonal, then I can swing my bishop to d5, preventing a rook from coming to g8. So um, the h6 pawn is weak. The diagonals are weak. You have two knights against two powerful bishops here. Totally. And that is a sad day for Zavan Adresian. He started with a, with a loss, and now this could be... His second loss, not something that we usually see from the top board of the Eagles. He won the Pro Chess League for the Eagles, basically the last game that we saw on site. Yep. And remember, Robert, remember, yep. you were commentating with Danny. How could I it was a nail biter, and Zavin and Andresian won it. He won the Pro Chess League 2018 for the Eagles. But now, today, he's going down in his second game again. Yeah, it doesn't look very good here. And I, how could I forget that fist bump as he was about to force a resignation by his uh, opponent from Shangdu. And actually another game that just caught my eye is the game between Jan Elvist and Grigory Oparin. I've made many comments today about how strong Oparin is, but it's hard to be strong when your king has no shelter. And if you look in that game between Malev and uh, Oparin, well, their king on g8, <laughs> where are the pieces Ooh. defending it? Where are the pieces at? I, I don't know what happened here. <laughs> I'm, I'm very worried for that king because queen h7 check, of course, is the immediate threat. Queen g6 check doesn't look so bad either. Uh, I can go anywhere with check, right? It's just the king is wide open over there on the king's side. And I think white has no worse than a draw in a position like this because there will be so many checks. But how to win is maybe a different matter altogether. And um, I, don't, I don't see it just... I'm trying to find the... Conceptualize a path to defense for Oparin. Sometimes mm -hmm. the best best path to defense, I can't even say it because it's so difficult to find, <laughs> is instead of just being all uh, passive and trying to protect your king, is being active. Sounds counterintuitive, right? Because I'm saying you don't have pieces towards your king, but let's say I take on c1 
you take back, I've got knight takes b3. My idea is to take your pawn on d4 next, but I see queen h7 check, king f8, and then bishop g6. So here, activity is not, at least seemingly not the way to go, because while I see a very direct play for white to continue um, amping up the pressure on that king. So take on c1 was played, and here Elvis is going to decide, do I take on c1 first, or do I play queen check? I would take on c1 because I want to save my check, and now seeing that knight takes b3 runs into that mating net, I play them with king to f8 and try to run towards the center and away from where white's pieces are aiming. Thank you, Midnight Rhino, for giving me a telescope to find black's pieces. I definitely need one because I can't see anything around the black king except for the h6 pawn, which doesn't do anything. So it's a naked king. It's a bare king with no defense, and that is the reason why even though white is a piece down, he might be just winning here. It's, it's a very promising attack with the queen coming in, queen h7, queen g6, or rook c5. There's so many promising moves in this position. Yeah, but there's just, there's no, you know, it's like um, all the bricks in, in this Oparin's king's side house was were blown down here. So, um, what is that, the, the Little Red Riding Hood? You huff and you <laughs> puff and you blow the house down? Is that, I'm not sure. I, I've seen that I'm being called a Little Red Riding Hood in the chat. I'm wearing today the Proches League t-shirt, just so that you guys know that um, I'm not wearing my hoodie yet, but that's also red. True, no, I no, love red. It's not Little Red Riding Hood, it's three, um, I was say the three bad wolves. No, it's the three little pigs. That's what it is. Oh, I was, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, yeah I was like, three little hesses, <laughs> according to Rand today, not. <laughs> well, there, there are, there is a wolf in Little Red Riding Hood. Right? Yeah. So that's what got in my head. I was like, oh, okay, but it's three little pigs. My bad. I'm sorry. Made a wrong reference here. Forgive me, please. I'll it's okay. It's okay, Robert. We understand that you may not be that up to date on 10 year old fairy tales. <laughs> yeah, 10 feels generous too. I mean, maybe, maybe six. Um, but yeah, so let's see what's going on in these games here. So I'm just looking at the scoreboard. So Moscow up. I'm going to pull up the individual board scoreboard for a second here just to show who is doing what for each team. And mm -hmm. right now we see the Moscow Wizards are well ahead in their matchup with Diamond. They're about to clinch the matchup. And for the Wizards, we've seen Boris Savchenko. He somehow drew that game where he was just down a piece earlier. And well, it's Vladimir Seliverstov who has three out of three for the Wizards. He's leading the charge for them to get the victory in their matchup. It's just one point, isn't it, that the Wizards are missing to clinch the match already. But remember, guys, that it's not only about the team victory, but also how many points the victors can score. So first of all, it's 10 points for team victory, but then every single game point is added to that score. Therefore, of course, every team wants to win, not just the match, but score as many wins as possible to increase their lead. Yep, definitely. You want to win by as large a margin as possible. So don't take your foot off the pedal just because you've already won the match. You want to win, you know, 14 to two, like the Dallas Destiny did against the San Diego Surfers earlier in the year. Yeah. The Wizards certainly were a team that earlier, a few weeks ago, I thought that they were in danger, even of relegation or not making it to the playoff for sure. But ever since they kept on winning, uh, they produced some miraculous wins and also they did well in the Battle Royale. So at the moment, they are doing very well in the Eastern Division. And today, too, they are winning their match. So that's very promising for the Russian team, but not for the Phoenix, which is the other team from Moscow. Yeah, the Phoenix are in last place, and the Wizards are in third, heading into the action as I just pull up the standings. But, all right, we see how, we'll continue to see how these games finish up here. We have um, the Horses playing well against the Stormbringers from Volga, including this game between Elvis and Oparin. Elvis still competing here, trying to play for a win. I have this feeling on it though that if he doesn't do something quickly right and black mm -hmm. just gets a couple moves and gets the king safe then that extra piece will make itself felt so if i'm black here i'm playing a move like knight to c6 just trying to get to the safety of my king i'm a knight closer to my king makes it feel a lot better i'm attacking the d4 pawn um, so knight c6 definitely feels like a good move for a pawn but maybe after knight c6 queen h4 check 
king f6, queen f4 check, there's some kind of potential for a draw, but actually then black plays e5, and I cut off your protection of the c7 rook. So still... Maybe this is not as easy as it seemed earlier. I wonder if, if uh, white has made something that wasn't the most precise, because now I feel like black is back in the game. After knight takes b3, he's threatening to take on d4 as well. And that's not just about the pawn, but the queen trade. Threatening to trade queens when your king is in trouble should be one of your main defensive weapons. Absolutely. And I think here, if I'm white, I'm bailing out queen h4, queen f4. Queen h4 check. You can't go to e8 because bishop g6 will lead to a checkmate. And after queen h4 check, you're king d6. Then I go queen f4 check and just gotta go back and forth. So that looks like a good way to hold. And actually, that's what's probably going to happen here. King d6 played, queen f4 check, mm -hmm. and we're going to see this draw. And a nicely held game by Opar, and it looked very dangerous for him. But maybe we overestimated Elvis' attacking chances just because the king looked like it was in tough shape doesn't mean it necessarily was. And True. It's not so easy to convert it. We don't know what the engine would have said about that position, but certainly to the human eye, it looked like a very nice potentially winning advantage for white. Not as easy as it's said, of course. Yeah, so this game held, and that's good for the horses nonetheless, because they're ahead, but they, of course, want to uh, finish this game, not excuse me, this matchup, they're up five and a half, now four and a half, so if they won the game, they would be much closer to that eight and a half point threshold required to win a match. And I see a bunch yeah. of games just finished at like the same time right now. Indeed, I was just going to see if there's any that in time trouble. Zevin Andresian is, well, I was going to say he's in trouble still, but maybe he's still in trouble, but he has somewhat improved his chances because the white king is more open and there are checks, queen d4 check, the g5 is open too. So maybe he will manage to survive this game, which would already be a big miracle. Yeah, because when I see this position, I want to put that bishop on d5 on b2. Right? If I had a bishop on the dark scores, even if I'm not winning the queen, let's say the queen was not on c3, just that's the diagonal you need a bishop on because the king is so open. But the bishop on d5 is a good piece. It just can't deliver that knockout check that you really want to, to end the game. And so, okay, white is retreating. The d6 pawn is now under attack. The rook on b8 is stuck protecting b7. So if you play queen takes d3, maybe white plays rook b to d1 or rook f to d1, some rook to d1, go after the d6 pawn. But still, black is at least temporarily up two pawns now? Yeah, that's the second pawn yeah. that black will win after queen takes d3. So you need to play with that energy if you're um, Levon Ponsulaya because the material will matter if black's king finds some safety. I think he is doing well in terms of uh, surviving this game, which already looked terrible in the middle game. And after queen g7 offering a trade of queens, white should definitely not trade. He's a pawn down. He has to keep the queen on the board in order to attack, create attacking chances against the king on aj. So where shall we place this queen? I want to take on d6, but I know you're going to play rook d8, and then I'm going to have trouble protecting the d3 pawn anyway. Do I play um, queen h3 here, just attack f5? That's also possible. I can play queen h5, similarly keeping an eye on f5. But I guess if you go queen h5, you're going to go queen g4 and keep trying to trade queens with me. Hmm. Oh, but actually then I take you because your b7 pawn is hanging. So you actually have a difficulty trading queens there. Hmm. True. So the queen will be attacking the f8. Oh, sorry, no, I thought that the f8 rook would be hanging, but the h7 knight is there, hiding, but it's there. So queen c5, okay, going after a7, and if a7 falls, then b7 is next. I like how Putzlai has been playing these last few moves here. Um, so he's gonna take on, took on a7, I was gonna say he could take on f5 as well. Maybe I would have taken on f5, mm. because that pawn is one that is limiting my bishop on g2. My bishop wants to go to e4, and if I take on f5, then I can just start teaming up on that knight on h7 and on the king's side. But okay, queen a7 is a very natural move as well. This game seemed to have been a bigger advantage earlier for Pantolaya, but what he's doing very well is keeping his time advantage. It's eight minutes for the Georgian and only three minutes left for Zevan Andresian. That's troublesome, but so far he has been defending very well. So maybe more than the time situation, what matters is that Black has improved his position significantly from the position where we tuned him first. 
Yeah, and I actually just saw the court. Manhei. Badur Jabal lost his game against oh. Samvel Tursahakian. Tursahakian with the black pieces. He made this move rook to c6, and Jabawa resigned. And the reason why he resigned is if you look at the material, black is up a piece. And if you take my queen on e7, I take your queen on b6. And very importantly, my knight on f6 defends my rook on e8. So it's not like I'm losing my rook and getting back from checkmated. It's defended. And let's see how this happened. After rook to e1. I'm curious, where did he drop the piece? Well, he played a risky looking position. And then after rook e1 and move 25, Tursahakian needed no more temptation than to take on c3 with the rook. Because if you take back on c3 with the bishop, queen e3 check comes, king f1, knight takes g3 with check and mate. So after rook c3 went bishop f3, and simply rook c6 retreat. Now you're up a full knight. Um, and the rest is, as they say, quite easy. So Jabal just simply threw in the towel and resigned. Oh, this is a very bad day for Badur Jabawa at the office. He has scored 50% so far, one and a half out of three games, but it could have been worse. He was basically in a very bad position against Anna Sergisian in the first round. And then he pulled out a miracle save, but he is definitely not in his best shape. And I don't think he will be happy about his performance. So you don't think he'll be dancing anymore on the stream? Uh, we, we need some update from Pro Chess League Commissioner Greg Shahadi on Badur Jabawa's dance moves. How is he doing at the moment? Yeah, um, I can't wait to, to hear that, but I assume he's not happy. I mean, he can't be happy after that loss. And the gentlemen are in first place with the Eagles very close behind them. So let's take a peek at some of these other games. I see Anna Sargisian lost her game against Luka Paichadze. And, well, that queen on a6 is under attack. Oh, look at what just happened, Anna. She oh, let me check. And we have some update on Mr. Jabawa, too. But I want to find the game first. Anna Sargisian with the white pieces. Oh. What happened? She went rook takes g6. That's her final move because rook a7 oh, no. happened and she resigned. She had a nice looking discard. Her position is great here, by the way. She yeah. is just a much better position, more control over the squares. Okay, I don't think it's, you know, a, like winning or anything. Of course not. But I think I prefer to have the white pieces. I like the bishop. She plays rook takes g6 thinking, oh, if you take my rook back, I'm going to win your rook on b7. The simple sidestep by Paichazi, rook a7. And once you move your queen away, as it's under attack, you lose this rook on g6. So queen takes b6, met by pawn takes g6, and white goes down a rook for just a couple pawns into a lost position. So an unfortunate blunder for Anna Sargisyan in a totally normal, good-looking position, plays rook g6, and, well, that's all. This is really sad for Anna Sargisyan. Of course, she has played so well this game as well and all the previous rounds, so definitely it's... An unfortunate blunder, but it can happen. She's playing against Grandmaster as every single round. So he, she has faced three 26 or 2500 Grandmasters. And so far, she has scored one and a half out of two. Now, this is going to be only 50%, but only against, the, against all Grandmasters. I think we would all sign this score, getting half, half of the points when you face Grandmasters every single game. Absolutely. And Nico Volkov has one and a half out of two. So he's got a plus score. But if he does not hold this game with the black pieces, he will drop to one half out of three, which, like you said, having even score against Grandmasters, there's nothing to be upset about there. And he has the black pieces. He's up on the clock, even material. Both kings feeling a little airy, but the king on h7, I think, is in worse shape as. The king on h2 at least has the dark square bishop covering all those squares. And the king on h7, well, that's... I can imagine a future, say you move your knight somewhere like knight f2, then rook d5 comes, threatening rook takes h5 with check and mate. So I definitely can see here how Nico Volkov should be careful and can be concerned about his position as his knight on d3 is also in a weird spot and vulnerable to some threats. So rook e8 played, queen f7 respond to immediately and again, it's h5 pawn. The knight on d3 is a little bit stuck. What to do here as black? That is the right question, but the answer is not easy, Robert. Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure it out. Because um, it just seems like white's pieces are all better. The queen is better for white. The rook is better for white. I mean, maybe approximately level. Rookie 2 just played. 
And now queen f3 or queen f1 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, what's going to happen with those multiple attacks? So after queen f3, the knight is hanging, the rook is hanging, uh, but and five pawn is sometimes in the air if the queen moves. Knight e1, what a tricky move. The queen, Ooh, the, the queen now protects nice. the rook on e2, and now the knight attacks f3 and the pawn on g2. So you might have to, that might be really bad for white. So maybe queen f3 actually doesn't work out the way. Then what about queen to f1 with similar ideas that the rook can't move because of the knight hanging? But anyway, he played bishop to g3. Now queen f3 is a threat because he's covering the e1 square. Yep. Yeah, this is actually looking. I really feel like Black's position is, is difficult here. Like, I, I'm not convinced that Black will find the shelter he needs for his king. And how do you actually make progress? Are there going to be some tactics with, like, pawn to h4, just distracting this bishop and trying to get queen e5 check on the board? Yeah, I think that could be a tactical motive that works. And h4 Found is it. on the board. Nika Volkov, 2100 at classical chess but his blitz rating is 2500 he has performed extremely well for the gentleman and he's going for it he's fearless yeah he's playing really really well right now so queen e5 check and now after bishop g3 i think he's a sack on g2 rook takes g2 and then queen e2 check and pick up the rook on d1 so just to put that on the board here that queen e2 check happens and oops, you lose this rook on d1 next and black has defended everything beautifully played by Nika Volkov, queen e2 check, and then he picks up the rook, so it was a temporary rook sacrifice. Yep. Yep, so he takes on d1. I don't even know what to think about here. Now queen f5 check and probably just make a draw. Just say, all right, you know, my king's not so safe either, um, but you know, just keep checking queen c8, queen f5, and that should be a shake of a hand hands yes after this game we are going to turn our attention back to the first two matches the movers and the phoenix they are about to finish their match as well as the dynamites trying to hold it against the wizards but the wizards only need one more point to win the match yeah i pulled up the game between andrasin and pancelai very quickly because pancelai has made clear progress queen on d4 pinning the rook on g7 rook on f4 piling pressure on this f5 pawn so rook g to f1 is possible here just trying to win it so a nice looking position for pancelai but i agree with the chat we're going to try to get to the phoenix mumbai movers just because that is the first match that's going to be concluding and it is a close one so let's Pick a game from that match. Do you see any one there that particularly catches your eye? Um, I'm trying to scroll through them and see which one is the most exciting. I'll let you know in a moment. Okay, no worries. Um, There's a potential attack between Tekarev and Nubarshak, our underwater hotel designer with the black pieces, once again trying to defend it. Okay. But maybe this is not so dangerous. The queen normally is looking dangerous on g4 and the knight can jump to f5. The pawn on h6 is hanging because of the pin on the g file. Yep. But it doesn't look like such a difficult task to prevent the capture of the pawn. For instance, queen to f6 defends the pawn and activates the, the black queen. Yeah, queen f6 is really good. Uh, you know, Bishop d4 would be the move you want to play as a response, but black can always put the knight on e5 back to attack the queen on g4, kick it away, and stop the queen on f6 from being uh, under threat. So, um, Robert, can we show once again the player card? I think now our underwater hotel reference doesn't make that much sense to the newcomers. So if we can remind everyone that we have been looking at quotes by the players and we have a fun one from Mr. Mohamed Nubarshak Sheikh. Yep, he designed and prepared a model of an underwater hotel. So if that's not unique i don't know what is really fascinating stuff by the mumbai mover and okay back to his game here he went queen to d3 after putting the knight on e5 now white can still play bishop d4 but i assume bishop d4 is going to be met by the move f6 and just protecting that knight on e5 you tend not to want to play f6 because it ruins your light squares Good thing for black, you have a light square bishop. So the knight's not coming to f5. <laughs> Still, yeah. And um, it seems like you've kind of, you're able to control all of the Swiss cheese holes on your king's side. 
as Danny would love to say for sure. By the way, where is Mr. Ranch? Can you let us know what's going to happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow? Yeah, Danny's on en route to Boston, to well, Cambridge, where at the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, there will be a panel on chess, and Danny will be the host of the panel. I'll be on it uh, answering questions. Same with uh, Larry Kaufman, Grandmaster Larry Kaufman, who mm-hmm. is one of the um, leaders of Komodo and has been dealing with chess engines for decades. Uh, we also have Folkert Zinga from Lila Chess, and I'm not sure if anyone else is part of that. I think there might, they might have added someone, but I can actually, I don't know if I'm allowed to put the link in because maybe I'll just get kicked out of the chat, but I, let's try. Let's try. I think this is, a, this is something fascinating to, to the chess community. Um, basically, artificial intelligence in chess has been such a trending topic, so we would definitely love to know more about the panel. I would certainly love to know more about the panel. Yeah, no, so I just posted in the Twitch and actually let my comment stay there, so good. That's, Yay! That's, that's awesome. So, all right, well... You're a VIP, Robert. <laughs> um, maybe only to you and to my mom. So, I mean, that, uh, that's meaningful to me. I don't need more than that, you know, just... It's thank you. <laughs> Perpetual sim. I'm still, I'm still not forgetting about the chocolate. I know you are trying. I know you are trying very hard, but you know I have my priorities in life. Yeah. Well, the chocolate I haven't forgotten about. I even tweeted and used chocolate in the tweet. Right? Those. I know. There. I'm just teasing you. I'm teasing you as much about the box of chocolate you owe me, as much as you tease me about a certain opening. I don't know if you get it, Robert. Um, you'll get your chocolate, don't worry. But <laughs> before you get your chocolate, we'll have to find... Ooh, 13 seconds left in the game with Zavin and Pansulaya. So I just saw the numbers ticking down here. And Pansulaya up a pawn, and the A6... Well, sorry, it's on A5, but I want him to go A6. That A pawn is getting close to queening. But it looks like if you play A6, does Black have some opportunity to sacrifice the rook for the pawn, and then somehow win the c-pawn and the bishop. That's the real question. So a6 played, knight takes c5, which means that white should just play a7. And after rook... Yeah, who's going to stop that pawn? Rook a4, bishop... Oh, interesting move. All right, so just moves the bishop away from attack. We'll play rook c7, then rook c8, and then get a queen. Very nicely done by Pansulaya. Just rook c7, I think, gets it... Just wins. Yeah, rook c8, get a queen. Bad day in the office for the top board of the Eagles. Zavin Andrasian going down in this crucial match between the gentlemen and the Eagles. This is for the top spot in the Eastern Division, and it matters. Both teams are likely to make it to the playoffs, but the higher your team is ranked, the better your chances are in the playoffs. Yep, and a nice win for Pansulai here to get the gentleman to a 7-5 to five lead. And okay, Phoenix Movers. That's where I want to focus our attention for the time being as we are mm-hmm. in the last round of all the action. Moscow Wizards are going yeah. to beat the Dynamite. Um, maybe if some games are interesting, we'll keep an eye out for that. But So we looked at Mohamed Nuber Shaikh, and that's one game. What are the other games? I think I see we Abimanyu Puranik with the white pieces yeah. against Mikhail Demidov. And Puranik up a pawn in the position but his pieces are stepping on each other's toes. Like the knight in d3 is in the way of the rook protecting the bishop on d6. If you move the knight, you lose your e3 pawn. Or actually, mm-hmm. bishop c3 is a big threat, isn't it, for black? Yeah, I'm not sure what shall be the response. Now with the pin on the d5 and bishop c3 in the air, how do you prevent both, actually? Uh, it's going to be tough to protect all these threats, right? If you're knight f2, I can either take on e3, or like we're talking about, play bishop c3. If you move your bishop, I'm just going to go bishop c3. You can't move a rook to protect that bishop. White has one minute left on the clock, so knight f2 plays. That doesn't help. That doesn't have to find some kind of a miracle escape. Well, wait a second. Actually, bishop c3, I guess white will play rook to b1, and that way the bishop on d6 now opens up an Ooh, attack. That is so pretty. That is really pretty. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see if this actually holds because bishop c3 looks so natural, just attacking two rooks at the mm-hmm. same time, but perhaps it isn't quite good enough. So I, I got asked to put up the scoreboard, just put up the scoreboard, but I'm going to have to go to the big board just because it's easier to see all the chess from the larger board here. 
Definitely. And those of you wondering about the next broadcast, this is the Eastern Division and upcoming division is the Central Division with Alexandra Botes and David Proust. So right after our show is over with Robert, you're going to see Alexandra and David taking over. Yep. And uh, this is going to be a great show for sure. Um, the Central Division is a very interesting one. And ooh, look at this. Rook C7 check, intermediate move, intermezzo there. Bishop takes before coming next. But I think White's going to have a problem on the second rank here. Like if I get a rook a2, then I'm throwing pawn to h3. It's looking uncomfortable, to say the least. And rook a2, bishop c3 will be played, threatening rook g7 check. But at the right moment, I'm probably, you know, move my king to f8 and first, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's getting a little tricky here. Rook, rook d6. Yes, it doesn't look as simple, even though black is material up, but the king... There are tactical elements now with the bishop on the long diagonal, rook g7 is a threat. The knight doesn't have many squares, so you can't just jump away from it. He plays rook to d3 because the knight is pinned on the second rank. But is this a good move? If rook g7 check, king to f8. And if you take um, on g6 and take on c3, that should definitely favor... Blood. Yeah, I was going to say in that position, if I move the bishop and the knight will still be hanging, but yeah, where do I move the bishop? Yeah, it's tough. It's... Because the d2 square, if I give up the d2 square, you can play rook d to d2. Yep. But maybe actually, I don't know, can you play rook takes a7 here? No, you can't because then, wait. Oh, almost. Wait, can you do that? No, because then after rook a7, rook a7, knight d3, there's rook a3 winning a minor piece on the third rank. Hmm. But it's clo oh. He plays king to f1 to threaten the rook, but this is looking suspicious. If black just takes on e3, he has a nice square on f4 for the knight. Yeah. And uh, the bishop will still be hanging after rook g7, checking f8. Yeah, this is going to be a tough ending here for white because black has so much more time and the position is just on the verge of falling apart. But there are some sort of drawing mechanisms with knight f6 check, knight h7, but here just rook takes f3. I mean, that's just a looking like a free pawn. Take that with check. Yeah, I take it with a check. Free stuff. I'm loving it. <laughs> I know you. You're The pawn, it's free, it's check. What else can you ask for? You're greedy. I know. I am. I want my chocolate, too. So king g1. Now what's the follow-up? So h3, is h, I guess the question is, does white actually have some sort of uh, check going on forever? h3, knight f6 check, king f8. Bishop b4 check, is that mate? No, I have knight e7, but I'm... Uh, Almost mate, yeah. But I have to give my knight on e7, that looks weird. Okay, so I have to watch out because knight f6 check is a legitimate threat. So maybe rook a4 to stop this bishop b4 check beating idea. Yeah just to be on the safe side black is not in a rush to win this game yeah but just be careful right you know don't yeah don't get complacent. definitely don't don't step into the last possible tricks of white with rook g7 bishop b4 the knight coming in so those are the few tactical motives that white has yeah so uh muhammad sheikh's game i see not much time there either so we're gonna have to be flipping back and forth between these games very quickly as it's seven and a half Six and a half in favor of the Phoenix. Moscow Wizards, by the way, have won their match. They've already passed the eight and a half points. In fact, they have nine and a half right now, so that's great for them. But these two yeah, games... They're collecting even more points. Between uh, Zaur Takiev and Mohamed Sheikh, where it looks like Takiev just grabbed a pawn on h6, and it's his move now. He's getting under 20 seconds. So he has to move a little bit more quickly. But mm -hmm. he's up a pawn. It's still huge compensation for black, better pieces, much more um, active pieces, that is, and opposite color bishops always are good for giving great drawing chances. So bishop f4, now queen takes h5 is a free pawn, taken. Yeah. So this is going to be huge. It'll tie the score in this And there's 14 seconds left. Oh, my. And, and the real question is, can Purinic survive that game? Because if he cannot survive that game, then it doesn't matter, as the Phoenix will win the matchup. Which game do you want to stick to? I'm going to go back and forth. I'm sorry. I'll just let you know when I go back and forth. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's depending on one point. So, guys, if the Phoenix manages to get one more point, they win the match. That's why we are looking at these two games at the same time. 
But Poranik with an exchange down, uh, well, he's still got tricks after knight g5, that's true. Yeah, he's trying to go knight e6 check, knight g7, knight back to e6 and make us, wait a second, knight, g knight e6 check. He drew, king e8, knight g7 <gasps> check. He stepped into it. He he forgot about this tactical element. Now it's a perpetual check. This is, guys, a way to escape from a lost position. Remember how the knight and the rook are placed. The knight always defends the, the rook with a check, and then it's another check on g7. It's a draw. Wow, what an escape here. I'm glad we tuned in for that. Really nicely done. Knight d8 what? protects the rook. Nice, excuse me, attacks the and protects the rook. But let's go right back to the other game. That was a draw here, and it's all down to this game if... Mohammed Sheikh can win this game, then they tie the match. Otherwise, it is a win for the Phoenix. And right now, Sheikh is up a piece. Is he? Oh my! He's up a piece. It's Rook D seven. They might. They might just upset the score. It was. It was about to be a team victory for the Phoenix, but now if Nubershak wins, then it's gonna be a tie. Yeah. Now Queen E three check. Just trade off. The queens, I guess, or knight d3 is probably even better. He's keeping the queens hey, he in the board. He goes back to d7, but this is still looking good. Yeah, you have two minor pieces for a rook and only one pawn, and your pieces are so active. Your knight c6. To okay, a6, I like that. Cementing the pawn structure on that side of the board so that when you go after the b4 pawn, it can never move. And look at this. Next move can be knight c6. Uh, here, just queen takes b4. e8 is protected. Muhammad, shake. He likes to build. He's collecting the pawns on the queen side, and now it's equal material in terms of pawns, but that means that two minor pieces for the rook. <gasps> we have one second left for taking him. <laughs> yeah. Normally, it's two minor pieces for a rook and a pawn. That's said to be equal material. So, in this sense, it's one pawn up for black, and now two pawns up yep. if we count. That way, it's material up for sure. He was certainly queen c7 check, picking up the rook. Look at you, spying it. Check. Puzzle rush time. Yeah, this is just now completely winning for black up two minor pieces with the queens on the board. And it's just really over here. Any, As long as you don't blunder anything and don't let the A pawn start rolling down the board, you're winning. So offering the queen trade, always good. The bishop will come to C6, which will help in a checkmating attack. Okay, queen E2 check is way more direct. If you go king H3, I can even- And it's over. White is almost flagging, but his chances, it's two pieces. He's getting mated. Mohamed Nubershak Sheikh manages to tie the score in a match that was already a win for the Phoenix. It seemed to be decided and then an upset came in two games at the same time. Wow, what a performance by the movers. Yeah, that was really awesome here because that was clutch as clutch comes. Coming back from a deficit, a draw by Puranic in a dead loss position. So unfortunately for the Phoenix, their struggles in the protest, they continue. Fortunately for the Mumbai movers, well, they live to see another day as an attempt to qualify for the Pro Chess, yeah. League, Pro Chess League playoffs. So we're Yeah, they still have chances there in the fifth place at the moment, but with a defeat, the, the chances would have been way worse, of course. And as you said, the Phoenix are struggling. They are the team that didn't show up at the Battle Royale because they thought that they were going to play on Thursday and not on Tuesday. Unfortunately, they didn't realize that the schedule was different. So they lost their chance to score in the Battle Royale and they are the eighth ranked at the moment. Yep. And let's hop on over to the matchup between the Horses and the Stormbringers because the Wizards have already won against the Dynamite. It's not that the games aren't interesting, but more relevant to what's happening is going to be the Estonia Horses and Stormbringers. And finally, the Armenian Eagles and Tbilisi Gentlemen. So let's go to some of these Stormbringers games here. I pulled up my Narva's game against Vasily Korchmar because as I look at this position, my Narva, she is up a piece and just clearly wow. winning against... Vasily Korchmar, who outrates her by 100 rating points, but she had the white pieces and she's a very strong player. And well, looks good for the horses in this one. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I wonder at what point did uh, Black drop the piece, but it looks like he was in trouble from Forever. quite an early stage in the game, right away from the opening. She took the initiative. I'm going back a little bit when she pushed e5, e6, very strong moves. So she kept attacking the whole game, and now she's just a piece up. Yeah. No By the way, a reminder uh, from Tis in the chat is that in the match between the Movers and Phoenix, uh, Kravkin disconnected in one of the games that we were observing. That's true. If that game had been won by the Russian Grandmaster, 
that changes the whole outcome and the story of the match. Absolutely. That's a great thing to keep in mind. It's something that Sam Copeland, now I'm going to call your name, remember to keep that Sam. in your head. Yes. A M. You got to put that in your report for sure because yeah, that changed the dynamic of the match too. Because the movers were down two games and they were about to be down a third game, and all of a sudden that changed from a three-game deficit to a one-game deficit with that victory. So Sam, I know you're listening. Thank you for all that you do, but that's got to be mentioned. And yeah. all right, so my is winning. Let's get off her game because it's going to be seven-seven when she wins. She has ten minutes left. She's completely won. Uh, who else is in this? There he is, Sam, and this. Amazing emote. I need to subscribe to Sam's channel to get the emote. I'm going to do that for the next broadcast because it's really definitely now my top favorite of emotes, yeah. has calls. One day I'm going to have hear Sam have a music video to Destiny's Child Say My Name because I say his name so much and he's just going to be oh, like, say my name, say, say my, my name. name. If no one is around you, say baby I love you if you ain't running game. All right, sorry. Just had a I saw I saw <laughs> Destiny Child it. perform. We're gonna make a band. I saw Robert, <laughs> you and I, pop band, Robana. I I did see Destiny Child perform many years ago, so that was a really fun Ooh. experience. Yeah, that Ooh. was. Uh, you know, I saw the Queen in her element with the band. So, yeah. Anyway. Okay, I think I think the chat is not so hyped about our pop music career, so maybe let's focus on the chat. It's fine. Now. You know, I just sing because I enjoy it. You don't always have to be good at the things you do, but um... of course, I also love dancing and singing. You guys know it. I'm making music videos now, even though I don't have singing skills at all. Yeah. Yeah. The band name would be Robana or anything else you guys can come up with. So just a pop band name for Robert and me. Ooh, Briakin and Twanberg drew their game. So that leaves the game between Oparian and Antonios Pavlidis for this entire match because I believe the score is going to be 7-half, 7-half. Once Minara finishes her game, she's just completely winning. And Oparian with the white pieces is down a pawn, and the B pawn is about to be captured as well. So Pavlidis is going to lead the horses to a victory if he can pull through here and finish this game off. <laughs> Kashmenka is saying that Javava immediately stopped dancing once Hess hit the chorus. Oh, that's that's rude. It's, that's rude. It's okay. I'm not saying Robert is a great singer. No, definitely not true. You don't have to lie to the fans. They know this. And <laughs> yeah. So it's gonna be seven and a half with Minerva's victory, and then the last game in this match is. It, I'm lost with whose board is still on. My is going to win. Yep. And then the other horses game. I can't see it. It's just Robert. Can you remind me? Oparin and. Uh, oh, the Oparin game. Yeah. So this, I didn't click on that one. But an Oparin has one minute left, and he's down two pawns. He can regain one of the pawns right now, uh, but oh, actually, can he? He might lose the F two pawns. So he went F three. And now can black just start pushing those pawns, play a5, and go for the queen side? Or do you play rook f5 here? That might be uh, just a little bit safer. Protect your e5 pawn, then push your queen side. Oparin just dead loss and down 10 minutes. Yes. <laughs> How do you do this? Like, 11 minutes for black, and the million pawns up. Okay, maybe it's just two pawns up, but it's pawns up. So 10 minutes up on the clock, plus two extra pawns. I, just, just nothing good I can say about white yeah. in this position. Nothing at all. So rook g4, what are you playing for? h5 now? Just trying to get some sort of fake attack. But if you... Fake attack, I love it. He's got to go for the fake attack because you need to at least make your opponent feel like he's under attack. Yeah, h5 just to go to g6, but then the king can always go to f7. So it's wishful thinking here more than anything. So it has my Narva. She's not won quite yet. But she's attacking this rook on f6 and this pawn e7. And okay, her opponent's trying, but she's still just totally, completely winning here. She'll put her queen back on g5 to protect her bishop. Okay, I'm not gonna look at this game anymore. It's just too over. Um, I, can't, I can't handle it. Just, you're up a piece and a pawn, and your opponent's king isn't doing well, so I cannot look at my Narva's game anymore. But this game between Oparin and Pavlidis. Oparin down to 26 seconds, 25. So into the 20s, while Pavlidis has 10 and a half minutes, and he can just play a5, then
then a4. Anna, can you predict what I'm going to say after a4? Oh, wow. After a5, a4, what's, what's coming next? I think a3 and then a2. I thought you were calling Sam. That's all I did. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not calling Sam. I'm calling Anna just to... Put, I'm putting arrows in the board, showing where that pawn's going. And I, yeah, I was looking at the other board, so I need to switch back. Give me a second. Oh, I was trying to look at the other game as well at the same time. Well, yeah, unstoppable, unstoppable. Can we can we get a song for that pass pawn, the A pass pawn? The A pass. What pawn? would what would be the theme song of a pawn like that? Um, well, you did just say unstoppable, which is a Sia song, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. That I really don't know that, that song at all. I just know like the one lyrics, like I'm I'm unstoppable. I'm a Porsche with no brakes. That's all I got for you. I don't remember anything else in that song. So that's all I got for you. But unstoppable is a good song. I'll take it. I'll take what I can. Uh, okay, so H5 finally played by Oparin, but that pawn's protected. Rook C8. Where's the fake mate happening here? <laughs> the fake mate. I love it. <laughs> just nothing is going right for White in this game. Can you just go a4, and then if rook a8, you play b5, and then eventually play rook a7 to trade off the rooks. Here it comes. <laughs> Thunderusk is saying a Porsche with no brakes is very stoppable. Ever heard of those things called trees? I'm just quoting a song. You don't have to be so literal. <laughs> Sam, no, of course. Sam Copeland. 11 seconds for a par in to try to give a fake mate. Uh, wait, rook takes d4. Does that win the rook? Oh, no, blunder. Rook takes d4. This is why when you have nine extra minutes, you should take a little bit more time. Ah! Look at that tactical vision, winning the rook on e2. But black is still doing well. Th three pawns that are passed over here. The fake attack almost has succeeded. The problem for white is that there are way too many pass pawns still, even though he has won a piece. A3, just push the pawn. Push him, baby. A3, rook A7. So very fortunate for Pavlidis to survive here. King C5 is the move, I think. It's got to be the move. We have a King C5, rook B3. Oh, no, Ooh. the king at pawn game is winning, I think. So, essentially, king c5, rook b3, rook a7, bishop b4 check, king c4, rook takes a3, rook a3, bishop a3, and then just b4, and my pawns are too fast, I think. I need You need to verify that, but that looks like what's going to happen here, because I don't believe in king d3, as then rook b3 check, and then you go after this pawn anyway. Yeah, I think it has to be king c5, just by principle, not to step into the check. But I wonder why Antonio was so quick earlier when there was a fake attack and he could have just calculated. Now he is still winning, I believe, because of the pass pawns. But it could, it could have been like over. It could have been game over much faster. Yep. And that's what happens when you rush in your opponent's time trouble. Sometimes you make bad decisions. So. Totally. Listen to Grandmaster Robert Hess. He's very wise and he knows that when you have time advantage, it doesn't mean that you got to speed up just like your opponent. Use your time very wisely. In the critical moments, think more. Seven seconds left. White has no time to think, of course. Yeah, this is, the, I mean, the pawns just roll. It's so easy to play with the black pieces here. You start pushing your pawns and eventually one of them is going to get a, become a queen. So here, rook d1, king c2, and then d1 equals queen. And that is all. So with this victory of Antonios Pavlidis for the Estonia horses, the horses managed to upset the Stormbringers from a match where they were trailing for most of the rounds. And now with a comeback win by my Narva and Antonios Pavlidis, finally the Estonia horses take home the victory. Huge win for the horses there. Uh, unexpected because of what was happening in that match. They came back to win it. And for the horses, well, they were in relegation territory, and they're going to hope that they can continue their winning ways and get into, mm -hmm. they're, they're out of the playoff race, that's for sure. But maybe they can just not make the playoffs, but still be in the league for next year. Remember, two teams from each division get kicked out and have to qualify once again. Those qualifiers are brutal. There's no guarantees there. That's for sure. 
and we are left with only one match, but that one match is the match of the day. The top two teams of the Eastern Division facing each other with a two-point lead for the Tbilisi gentlemen. The Eagles badly need to win a couple of games in order to tie the score at least. So 8-8 eight, eight would be a tie. Eight and a half is team victory. Absolutely. And B4 was just played by Zavan Andreasen. He knows what's needed from him in this matchup. He's going to play Bishop to C4 now. And Anna, this attack looks huge with his king on e7. And not to be underestimated as his pawn on h6, because with his pawn h6, sometimes if these, the rooks get distracted, like the rook on h8 has to move towards the center, which, well, actually you're just losing his pawn e6 right away, aren't you? Like you yes. Knight I was just going to say, it's funny how Zevan and Jastian has had a bad day. He lost a couple of games against underdogs, but in the crucial round, the final round, against his strongest opponent, he is actually crushing Badur Jababa, who also had a bad day. The two top boards are struggling today. Yep. And, I mean, this is just brutal. I don't know what Jababa did. This looks like a terrible opening. Your king's at e7, your pawn. Your pawn was on f7 instead of f5. I'd say, okay, I understand why black um, did this to get the king stuck in the center, but at least you're up a pawn. With a pawn f5 and a clear target on e6, you can't even play c5 to protect and just take on c5, and your queen is needed to protect e6, but your queen is going to kick that really quickly. Queen c6, rook d6, that's game over. Lights out, you're losing a pawn e6. And if you play knight d5 here, white goes queen to e5, threatening queen g7 check at the right moment, threatening rook to e1. The pawn on h6 is immune because of queen g7 check. So the pawn is protected through a tactical defense. And it just looks really terrible for Badur Jabawa. He's just going to, I think, he's going to get checkmated pretty quickly. Yeah, indeed. Um, before we continue with this match and these games, I just wanted to quickly switch to Tanya's game because Proches League Commissioner Greg Shahade is reminding us that something happened on the last move. So if we catch up with Tanya's game from move 35, oh, no. she's a piece up. And after Queen F2, she wanted to play Queen D1 check, oh, no. I believe. And she made the move so quickly in one second. It's almost like a pre-move. Mouse slip. Yeah, mouse slip just loses her queen. So Andrei Skvortsov gets two points at the end there. He beat the round three and round four opponents, two international masters, very strong. And Tanya Sachtev, that is not the way you want to finish your day in the Pro Chess League. So that's very sad. No, I'm, I'm very sorry for Tanya. She has played some really amazing games, but the score doesn't show it. She disconnected from one game, and then she mouse slipped in the last one. Oof. And I pulled up Samvel Tursahakian's game here because he is a vicious attack as well with the white pieces. So uh, Andreasian and Tursahakian with the white pieces, well, they're just going full steam ahead. Tursahakian's up a pawn and has the attack. So I think Levan Pantsulaya is in huge trouble. So that's two games that look to be in the Eagles' favor. That means they would tie up the score here. And who's left? That means Volko. Oh, but Anna Sergisian, who has done very well so far, I'm wondering about her position. Maybe maybe it's not too bad. It's at least perpetual check for Nika Volkov. Yeah. But I wonder if there's more in the position. White has sacrificed the piece to get this attack. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like the Elvis game we saw before against Oparin, right? It's a piece yeah. up for the side that's on the defense, but there's always these perpetual checks and you're right because queen h6 you can't go king to e8 without running into queen h8 check so king e8 queen h8 king f7 queen g7 king e8 queen g8 is checkmate puzzle rush style and instead <laughs> we're going to see king to g8 and g4 playing for the win here wow that's brave and knight e2 check wins the rook on c1 so he will still have to give the perpetual check after all yes so knight e2 check king f or somewhere knight takes c1 and then you still have this check that we were just looking at with queen h6 to g6 so the king has nowhere to run away for black if you go king h8 queen e8 check picks up the rook with a check once king goes to the seventh rank and if you go king f8 queen h6 we said before king e8 is not possible because queen h8 check king f7 queen g7 king e8 queen g8 is check and mate as the rook on d7 is the escape square that the king needs from e8 so knight e2 check played so this game should head towards a draw. Zavin Andreasen, just pulling that up really quickly. He is doing extremely well. Queen c7 for Jabawa runs right into rook takes d5. 
protecting the queen on e5, removing the guard of the queen on c7. So that would be a tactic that simply wins a knight and wins the game for Andreasen. So it looks like Jabawa is going down. We just saw earlier that Pansulaya is going down, or at least so it seems, and that leaves the game between Archer Gabrielian and Luca Paichadze and Anna. In that game, what is happening here? Everything is at stake and both queens are hanging. Yeah, you tell me because that queen can either take on d7 or rook takes f3 and lose your queen on b7. What is the yeah, deal Yeah, both are options. It's going to be a trade of queens no matter what because the black queen cannot move away from b7. The c6 rook would have been hanging. Okay. So we see a trade on f3, rook takes f3, then rook takes b3, and now rook a3 to grab the a5 pawn. And if black gets that pawn, it's equal material, likely to be a draw. That could be a very exciting 8-8 between these two top teams with the gentleman leading throughout the rounds, but the Eagles making a comeback in the last one. Yeah, there was a, there was a draw with um, Volkov and Anna Sargistian, so that is officially mm -hmm. in the book. 7-5, half, 5-1, half, the Tbilisi gentleman lead, but Gabrielian seems to be holding here with the black pieces against Luka Pachadzi. Zavin Andriasian, that uh, Jabawa's king, which went to d7, but after moves like queen g7 check followed by rook to e1, I'm not sure how much longer that king will survive. And then again, Sunville Tursahakian just made his move rook to c5, and now he just wins a bishop. The bishop on d2 is simply lost. So Pantulai is going to go down a piece. In addition to his king being weak, he's going to go down material. So knight takes d2, wins a free bishop. I would play that and just say thank you, Levon, you're a strong player, but today I was the superior one in our matchup. This is incredible. I'm just fascinated by the fact that the Eagles have managed to make a comeback and not just any comeback, it's board one and board two. The, the top two players are taking down the board one and board two of the gentlemen who are very strong grandmasters. There haven't been any big blunders. These were games where they just went all in from start to finish, both Devin Andresian and Sambat Ter Sakayan, taking the initiative right from the opening and going for a killer attack. Yeah, it's just a risky play by Jabawa and very straightforward, aggressive approach by the Eagles. And right now, Zavin Andreasian, he made this very calm move, bishop to b3. And, well, what's the point of bishop to b3? Great question, right? It's like, what is, what's the intention? Okay. Queen somewhere. Queen f6, queen e5 check. Those moves are both possible. Queen takes g6, mm -hmm. actually. It's just a free pawn. Yeah, I like free stuff. Uh, that's, that's a pawn. And then once that pawn goes down, e6 is yes. under attack, h5 is under attack. But maybe queen g6, there's queen h7 for... Oh, no, wait. There's c4 at the end of all this. Like, if I go queen g6, queen h7, I was worried mm -hmm. that my attack's fizzling Ooh, out. Ooh, look at g6! Look at that! <gasps> Whoa. Beauty. Whoa. So if rook takes e6, the ages rook is hanging. And if king takes e6, then the queen was hanging because the knight on d5 was pinned. Yeah. That was really nice. Let's just show that one more time. So if... King takes e6, you keep that rook on h8 defended, but queen takes c7, there's a pinned knight on that diagonal, so you win the queen. That is a high quality tactic. Taking that puzzle rook on h8. Puzzle rush at the best. I'm trying to use as many puzzle rush emotes I can in the chat. Guys, bring those puzzle rush emotes in. This is high class tactics. <sighs> That's really nice. And I, what did I say earlier, Anna, the pawn on h6, that could tell the tale, as that is an advanced pawn, a passer, and now it's actually just going to be promoting, it feels like. Yeah. It is still a problematic situation for the Black King, but combined with the h pass pawn, it's a resignable position. Of course, Jabal will try to somehow bail out, create a last trick, some tactical element, but... I don't even see what white can blunder. Hey, Anna, do you know what time Apart it is? Apart from a mouse slip, mouse slip maybe, or disconnection. Do you know what time it is? <laughs> do you know what time it is? Sam Copeland. Tell us, Robert. S Tell us. Sam. Hey, Sam. Yay! <laughs> Sam Copeland. Buddy, I know you're there. I know you're watching. It's Sam Copeland time. And because this is definitely game of the week 
territory with that rook takes e6 move and finishing Jabawa off one of the best players in the entire world here is just you know it's no small feat and so I don't know queen g8 here then playing h7 and playing h8 equals queen that looks pretty good you do yeah. have to be a little bit careful about your king on c1 because okay queen g8 play queen e7 and then rookie one check but okay there's not enough to attack with it seems like it's just a couple checks and uh, yeah Ter Sakhayan in the meantime has won his game already with a beautiful last move queen takes f7 wow okay let me pull yeah uh, the eagles are making a comeback definitely Oof, nice finish there and you said queen takes f7 was played the bishop on g6 pinned to the king on h7 which means you're losing your bishop so that game is over the gabrellian game is still going on here where white still has the past a pawn and that pawn might go to a6 next but is the look at that move rook d6 the point being if you take on d6 Ooh. rook a1 check king h2 bishop e5 check g3 only move bishop takes d6 now a5 is under attack i'm going to take your knight on b8 to win this a pawn if you go knight c6 Black has h4, trying to open up this king to give Black many, many checks and hold the balance. So rook takes e6 by Andreasian. Rook d6 guy by Gabrielian. These players are really doing wonders with their rooks in Definitely. There's something about these hanging rooks that the Eagles have prepared. According to their captain, Artak Manukian, they discussed the strategy. And maybe they were talking about these hanging puzzle rush motives no just kidding but of course they have very strong tacticians all these players both the gentlemen and the eagles and the eagles are taking their chances everything they can yeah this is they're down by one point with just two games remaining um zavin andreasin is about to win his game it seems like he went h7 here seeing that his king while there are some checks it's just a couple checks he'll be able to escape probably over to the a3 square in the worst case scenario, rook d2 is a possible block, but then I'm a bit concerned about rook e2. So it's not so easy where it's just game over right now. Oh, look at this, Anna. Rook d2, rook e2, pawn f4. If you go queen takes f4, Ooh. I have queen b8 check, trading the queens on f4, and then I'm getting a new queen on the Ooh, h8 painful. square. painful. Just taking every last bit of danger out of the position that's what white should do yeah king b2 probably also good and played because now rook e2 check you just block with the bishop a uh, bishop c2 here played okay that's pretty normal queen g2 18 seconds left for jabala the position is his main problem but there's some counterplay along that uh, second rank. Yeah, the second rank. So if white promotes a8 queen, rook takes c2, and that could even be made for black. Right. So let's not go there. So maybe. Well, how can white prevent oh, this? Giving checks. Gonna sack the queen for the rook. Queen e8 check. Ooh, and queen yeah, takes. Yeah, that's smart. He's gonna take. Oh, black is not allowing it. Knight e7. Ooh, that's interesting. But uh, now queen d7 check. King to where does he go? F7. And then can I get my queen? That's the real question. Is white allowed to get a queen? DJ knight check. <laughs> that would be awesome. Probably not the It may happen. It may happen. If it, if that happens, I'll give you another box of chocolate. <gasps> please, please. Now I need Zavin to play No. Where's my box of chocolate? No. Sorry. Almost. Almost. It's almost the night. Sorry. Oh, well, it would have been beautiful, but this is winning for Zavin Andresian, although maybe it's not the cleanest of wins because Black is still alive. Yes. No H pawn. It's a piece up, but now Black has two pawns for the piece. Pin on the seventh. Uh, pin on the sixth. Sixth? Oh, second. I, I can't <laughs> count anymore. Pin on the second rank. Two pawns for the piece, and there's no past pawn that is promoting. So suddenly, Jobaba is not that dead. No, uh, although Queen F7 mate looks like a pretty good threat. Rookie 7 played, okay. If we trade rooks, I do have to be careful with this H pawn, right? This H pawn is going relatively quickly down the board, so that's why he is going for the attack. We talked about this before. When you're up material and you have the safer king, you don't trade pieces necessarily, you go for the attack. And look what Zavin does. He has the E5 square for his queen to get to. 
I don't see a way to stop that. There's no. Three seconds for Jababa. Two, one. He's flagging. He flagging. <gasps> there he goes. Down he goes. There. Probably there was no defense anymore, but he couldn't even make a move. Wow. Nice finish by Zavin. And I wanted to say that in the meantime, Whoa. the other board, <gasps> Gabrielian is an exchange up. Wait. Rook takes a6, rook b8, check, and then he. White promotes. What happened here? White went for the win and instead went for the loss? Is that essentially what happened? So after rook d6, when do we see that? The rook d6, he allowed bishop to d4 to come into the board. And then when a6, but then rook f2 came, and all of a sudden, trouble started for white. And so black is a pawn up. This is a theoretically drawn endgame, but not comfortable to face when there's mutual time trouble. And good news for Pichazzi. Yep. He has a Certainly. minute. Yeah, he's got a minute on the clock, so he should be okay here. But if this king starts running up the board, you're not going to be happy. Black has some ideas. Go f5, f4, and then go f3 just to open up the pawn structure over here. But um, king f4 is coming. So if you go rook a5 check, king f4, pawn f5, g4. Rook a6 to stop king f4 because of the pressure on the f6 pawn. But now it's a check, and then king to e4 can come. So this is still not so easy for white to hold this game. If the gentlemen lose this game, that's a team victory for the Eagles, not just tying the score. They can win the match. So it's seven and a half, seven and a half. There's a point that's going to be updated. Seven and a half, seven and a half. Yeah, and this one is down to the wire here. And what white, excuse me, black wants to do is go king h5, pawn g4. And if you take on g4, here it comes. If you take on g4, my king starts approaching this g2 pawn. Now, this g4 was stopped because if you went g4, rook h8 followed by rook g8 check would have won this pawn on g4. Instead, the king goes back to g6. After rook g8 check, the king can go to f5. Um, making progress, not easy. Rook a5 check. So like I said, it should be a draw with proper play. But if you're Pichazi, you're a little bit nervous. It's not the simplest position that you could ever see here. Yes, this is still some work to do by the Georgian player. Uh, I'm wondering if the Eagles will actually manage to win the match by winning a drawn rook end game. Anything can happen, especially when there's no time on the clock. 14 seconds for Gabrielian, 39 for Paichadze. This is the final game. No other games are going on. The final game of the Eastern Division, and this is for the top place. The leaders will be coming out from this match. Yep. And Armenia trying to overtake the gentleman for the division lead, but the gentleman holding steady here. Um, Pachazi has shown good technique. Remember, there's a 50 move rule in chess. So if no pawn is moved or no piece are captured in 50 moves, the game is immediately ruled a draw. So here's f5. That 50 move rule starts all over again. Hmm. King f7. He's going to try to get that king to h5 now at the right moment. Or he's going to go king f6 followed by rook e6 to shelter his king on the sixth rank. So rook e6 now. And what you really need to do is keep gaining on the clock. Gabrielian's doing a great job here. Pachazi's yeah. on 25 seconds, and the time situation has evened up here. Yeah, okay. This could still be problematic for White to defend. I just can't believe how it feels for the gentlemen that they were winning the match. They entered the last round with two points of an advantage, and now they are fighting for their lives. Nice move, Okay, now it's it's already easy because uh, one pawn has been traded and the h4 pawn is hanging but after g3 well king e2 rook before he's got to defend the h4 king pawn. f3 and uh yeah your rook is stuck on the fourth rank so here just rook h8 and rook h5 yeah, forever now it's simple so king g5 rook g8 check just go back to h8 in the end, it's going to be a draw and it's going to be a tie between the Eagles and the gentlemen. That will mean that the, the gentlemen keep their lead, but only a few points separate these two teams. Five and a half points with two more weeks of the Pro Chess League regular season. Very likely that both teams will make it to the playoffs, but it matters who's going to take first place because that means better tie rig score for the knockout system of the playoffs. Yep. And... Pachadzi, just don't blunder, make the draw. <laughs> don't flag, don't blunder. It's all the advice don't I can give. It. Don't disconnect. 
And I w- you can see that these two teams, they are the top two teams because they both have, you see the connection, the connectivity next to the flag? <laughs> yeah. It's very good, isn't it? Excellent connection. That's how they do it. Perfect connection. Perfect connection. And now look at that Rook F4. Perfect disconnection of that Rook protecting the <laughs> H4 pawn. And- Picking a pawn in game, that's a draw. Just don't take last trick. Yeah, you... two kings on the board. What a fight between the top two teams! Congratulations both to the Eagles and to the gentlemen. Amazing battle, almost made it. The Eagles were trailing two points behind the gentlemen with one round to go, and it was an amazing comeback by the Armenians that almost became a victory with this game ending in a draw in the end. Absolutely, and as I pull up the individual scoreboard here to see how each player did. You'll note that Tanya Sachev, unfortunately for her, she uh, lost on time in one game, a disconnection. She blundered her queen in the final game. So she scored zero points despite being oh. a strong international master on board four. So it just wasn't her day with every issue going on. But whose day it really was is the Moscow Wizards and Sevchenko and um, Selverstov because they both went three and a half out of four. And when their board four, who's 2,000 rated, went two out of four, of course, they were going to win their match. Yeah, Savchenko, let's remember that he started with a game that was a piece down for him, just a clear piece down, and he managed to escape from that completely lost position. So there were some upsets, and some could have been even bigger. But today, I think we have seen board ones struggling in a couple of games, and that caused a really exciting match in every single matchup, basically. Even if the score doesn't show it, because some of them are more than decisive. I think the games were really, really thrilling to witness. And Robert, thank you so much for guiding us along all these positions. I love the moment when we were analyzing the technical end game and it was just a blunder mating one. Yeah, that was great. You know, I'm like talking about how the king can run over, sacrifice the bishop. Oh, just kidding, checkmate immediately. But Anna, <laughs> an absolute pleasure. I just see Cash Mankey in the chat saying there are major delays in Amtrak Northeast Regional. And so I, it looks like you got to do the afternoon PCL too. I hope you're kidding. Amtrak does have delays. Um, we want the double served by Robert no, Hess. No, we don't. We want. It's a standard in the Protest League. Robert loves the Protest League. He broadcasts eight hours a day every single time. Yeah, well, I do enjoy it. I love it. But for me, it's time to head out to catch a train to the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. And, um, well, Anna, it's been an absolute pleasure. You know I love doing commentary with you. You almost won another box of chocolates, but unfortunately, almost. one is going to have to suffice. And any final thoughts? Who were you most impressed by, disappointed by, or just, you know, what do you um, find? The comeback of the Eagles, I think that's going to be the most memorable to me. But also, today, we have witnessed a couple of disconnections. So it's uh, sad that sometimes weather, connect, weather conditions can decide games. That was uh, the case of the Phoenix. They would have won the match if they didn't disconnect. And Tanya, she's a friend of mine. I'm sorry to see that uh, she lost one game due to disconnection. Then she made a mouse slip with a piece up. So a couple of unfortunate games. But all in all, I think it has been a thrilling day. I'm very happy to see female players doing well, of course. Anna Sargisian has had some amazing attacking chess on the board. She scored uh, way above her rating, and she could have scored even more. Um, now it's going to be Alexandra and David Proust taking over for the Central Division. And I'm going to be back on my own channel after the second group of the Pro Chess League is over. So I'm going to be streaming tonight for you guys with a new emote, new emote alert. That's all I can say. And so hover over my face right now to see Anna's uh, channel in purple and there. And see Robert's channel. You want to make sure to follow and subscribe Robert's channel. That's this way or this way. Um, I think you're this way, I hope. I was No, this way. I never know which direction to point. This way. Just, Yay! Just point in one direction and hope that it's the story of your life and it works <laughs> out. I have a 50% chance and I never managed to guess it. <laughs> well, you have a... Pu- it's like the USB. Like, you know, you want to plug in a USB and it's never the right way. Yes. But it's okay. You mistook me for the pug on the wall, which is totally a reasonable mistake. So, uh, you know, on that note, uh, Anna, <laughs> it's time for me to go catch a train. Everybody here, thank you so much for tuning in. And stay put in just mm, four minutes. The next action will happen. So thank you to everybody Indeed. and enjoy the next division of the Pro Chess League. Thank you so much and see you guys later. Bye.